It is Tuesday, October 26th, and it is 6.34 p.m. I'd like to call to order the Groton Town Council Committee of the Whole Regular Meeting. Um, Councilors present, Granatoski, Bordelon, Bumgardner, Franco, Obrey, and Zapata. Yes, communications. The communication. You might want to move the mic closer, though. Uh, behind this mask <laughs> is a person that wanted to say thank you. I wanted to say thank you to all the people that have come out to our meetings, the people that have participated, uh, the council that I've worked with, um, certainly my family, my friends that have supported me. I uh, especially wanted to say that I think that the department heads that we've worked with, or I've worked with for the last four years, are of a, a great caliber. I think they do their jobs very, very well. We may not always agree, but I think that they're very professional and they overall do a very good job. Uh, I think our town manager has uh, Put up with a great deal and hung in there and and tried to direct us in the best way and i think that he does the same thing for the departments i think he's very loyal to his staff and that's as it should be um, the only thing i wanted to mention that isn't really a, a thank you is i just wanted to make note of the fact that we've had a great deal of controversy about our school properties and what's happened and what hasn't happened and I, I just wanted to point out that as you're analyzing things and you all go on in the future please remember the four school sales went very well and we're going to have four very good properties we have one that has created a little bit of a problem but I think that in the hoopla about that, it was forgotten that the planning department and the economic department did very, very well. And they have a procedure that I feel works very well. So again, I just wanted to thank everybody, everybody that did support me in the two elections that I ran in. And, and um, I look forward to being hopefully a very small part of the RTM in the future. Thank you very much. Thirty-seven and um, Councilor Melendez has joined us. Thank you very much, sir. One, two, three, four, five, six. So we are at seven councilors as of six thirty-seven. Councilor Bordelon, communications. Yep. Um, first, I just wanted to thank the town staff for the presentation um, that we had here. Uh, regarding how to spend the funds um, being part of the long-term recovery committee. I think it was great to kind of have the boards up and kind of, you know, paint the picture and see where things should go. Um, so that was uh, really great. Uh, also, I just wanted to congratulate the Fitch High School Marching Band on a wonderful home show that they recently had. Um, it was a large turnout, uh, raised a ton of money to support music and arts in our town. Um, and all the volunteers who worked uh, to make the day happen. Um, it's a great asset to the town to have that program. It brings in a lot of uh, folks from surrounding towns and all the people who donated to make it happen. So it was a wonderful event. And now we move on to states uh, this Saturday in New Britain and nationals in Pennsylvania on November 6th. So very proud of the marching band and all the staff and parents who support the program. Councilor Melendez. Nothing to report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, note that our town police department and the city police department both turned out to represent our community at the Safe Futures um, fundraiser, and that was that was heartening to see um, that we had people from our community there for Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So thank you very much to our PDs. Um, and we did have the open house for the ARPA funding, as Councilor Bordelon noted. And the platform is still available for those of you who may not have been able to attend. Uh, there's a link on our website, and perhaps that can be noted later on when the um, video goes up, that we are still taking um, feedback from the public. So we encourage you to um, offer your input. And Councilor Zapari, yes, you have the floor, sir. Um, I'd just like to make note of the fact that uh, we're still in the midst of the COVID pandemic. Numbers have come down slightly, but not really so that we can kick back and say we've got it made. 
I think that we have to remain vigilant. I think the council should do more. I think we should be mandating vaccinations for our employees. I think we should be taking a lead in making public statements about the importance of vaccination. I would call attention to the fact that Groton has had the second highest rate of infection in the uh, Ledge Light District, uh, second only to New London. Um, and uh, I, I think we have to move ahead on that. Uh, uh, I'd also like to make note of the passing of Dan Stewart in Waterford. He was a uh, man who made great contributions to his community. I think we can all aspire to uh, follow in his footsteps, uh, even though he's not a Grotonian. He, uh, he is an exemplary man in local politics. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Zapir. Mr. Bird, do you have anything under communication? Um. No, I just learned we're, is that what we're called, Grotonians? <laughs> I'm not sure. I never thought that. <laughs> just to mention, because not everyone checks their emails, just to make sure everybody saw their email yesterday, that we have moved on to the second phase for to full mediation, official mediation for the Mystic Ed Center project. So I just want to make sure everybody has read that. And the remedy that we would seek is what? The remedy that we had to apply to the... Uh, to the, uh, no, I just blinked on what it's called, the American uh, Mediation mm -hmm. Association, I believe, um, for the, the requested relief is for cancellation of the contract. Thank you. Are done All right, approval of minutes, 2021-731. We have September 28th minutes, October 5th minutes, and October 12th minutes. They begin on page two. Councilor Baumgartner, please. Yes, I'll make them. I'll make a motion to approve the Committee of the Whole meeting minutes for September 28, 2021, uh, the October 5th, 2021, and October 12th, 2021 meeting minutes. Is there second. A second. Moved by Baumgartner and seconded by Franco. Any discussion on the minutes? Councilor Baumgartner? Just there's a, a series of, um, of votes. Um, and motions where my name is A N D R E and just uh, could you give us the um, the spell. date of the minutes and then a page number so that, that when they're recording or when they're fixing it they know where to go. Yep, um, there's multiple. Okay. Um, Does it start with the September 28th and it runs throughout? I, I believe so. Um, okay. I know definitely the October 5th minutes and the October 12th minutes. Uh, and, so. and Lisa can go through. She yeah. doesn't need each other. Misspelling of your first name. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I apologize for that, but no. thank you for okay. noting it. Okay. Seeing no other hands, so we'll vote. All those in favor of the minutes, um, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? So moved unanimously. Seven counselors. Okay, we are on to new business, and we're going to start with 2021-6754, extension of appropriation for Groton 2020 school facilities plan. This begins on page 27 of your packet, and this is due to an error that was made, a typo that was done when the um, item was originally moved forward. So, Councillor Franco, please. Are we on page 36? Is that what you're saying? 27. Sorry. It's 20, that's okay. It's 2021-6754. Make a motion to recommend a resolution to approve extending the appropriation for the Groton 2020 school facilities plan to replace the previous resolution approved at the October 5th, 2021 council meeting to correct the amount of the bond to $184,500,000. I so move. Second, Bordelon. Moved by Franco and seconded by Bordelon. Mr. Burt, did you need to speak to this at all? Uh, I, I, th I think you hit it right on the head for what's uh, going on. Yeah, there was a, and it was introduced by the bond council. It was <coughs> an original error leaving uh, at a zero instead of a five for the 500,000. Um, so, and part of doing this is just to make sure we're all in the clear for spending the money, but um, luckily it was caught along the route, so. That's good. Okay, we 
we will vote on 2021-675, extension of appropriation for Groton 2020 school facilities plan. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Please. Any abstentions? So moved unanimously with seven counselors. At this point, um, the committee of the whole will recess. It is 644. The cow stands in recess, and we are going to go into the town council special meeting it is tuesday october 26 2021 at 6 45 p.m i'd like to call to order the town council special meeting councillors present granitoski bordelon bumgardner franco melendez overy and zapari councillors heed and parker are not with us so we have seven councillors we do have a quorum and the new business is item 2A, 2021 3964 Riverview Avenue update setting public hearing date on page two. Councilor Overy, would you read that one for us, please? What page is that? It's on the second <coughs> packet that came. It's probably at the very end there. There you go. And it's the second page. Thank you. You're welcome. Just a resolution um, for Riverview Avenue. Here at the, at the bottom? Oh. Uh, which do you want me to read? Start where it says uh, recommended action draft motion. Resolution to schedule a public hearing regarding transfer. Do you want the whole thing? Yes, please. Resolution to schedule a public hearing regarding transfer and sale of properties along Riverview Avenue, No Inc. Whereas the public has continuously used a piece of property in No Inc, Connecticut along Riverview Avenue for parking four decades and whereas it has been determined, determined the town of Groton does not own a portion of that uh, sorry you'll have to get sick for a minute does not own a portion of the property and whereas on October 12 2021 the town council committee of the whole met in a regular session and discussed a property swap negotiated between the town and the adjoining property owners and whereas at the meeting on October 12, 2021, the town council passed a motion recommending a notice, notice public hearing to be held at their November 9, 2021 meeting along with an informational session to be held immediately prior to that. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the town of Groton town council will hold a public hearing on November 6, November 9th 2021 at 6 30 as well as an informational session at 5 30 to solicit public input regarding the property with trade proposals all right so second right. moved by Overy and seconded by Bordelon mr burt any comment on this uh, just to remind the, or just to make sure the public understands, this isn't the uh, a public hearing for selling property. It's a public hearing uh, simply to gain to gain input. So this is what the council requested to to gather feedback Correct. from the community. And we will be set up here at 5:30 beforehand to uh, to provide information to people too prior to the meeting. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, seeing no hands, we will vote on 2021-3960 Riverview Avenue update setting public hearing date. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? So moved unanimously, thank you. Okay, um, Councilor Bordelon, 2021-675, please. I'll, I'm gonna pass. Councilor Melendez. Oh, um, actually, I, okay. This one, sorry, I got confused. This next one's a roll call vote. <laughs> I was thinking they both had to. Sorry about that. Are we good to go with the next yeah, one? Yeah, we're good to go. Sorry. Okay, Councilor Melendez, could you do 2021-6755, extension of appropriation for Groton 2020 school facilities plan, please? This begins yes. on page four. Yes, I make a motion correction to the resolution extending the appropriation for the Groton 2020 school facilities plan project. Resolved that the final paragraph of the resolution caption resolution extending the appropriation for the Groton 2020 school facilities plan project approved by the council on October 5th, 2021 shall be corrected to read as follows. Now therefore be resolved that any portion of said appropriation which has not been expended or financed on the effective date of this resolution shall be extended and reappropriated 
reappropriated, provided that the total amount expended or financed as of the effective date of this resolution, pursuant to said appropriation under ordinance number 284, as amended by ordinance number 291, plus the portion which is reappropriated shall not exceed $184,500,000, so moved. Second, Bordelon. Moved by Melendez and seconded by Bordelon. Mr. Burt, did you want to make your statement now? <laughs> okay, this is a roll call vote. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. Um, should I go ahead? Uh, with what? With the roll call vote. Oh, I can do it. I got it. Okay, okay. got it. Okay. okay, Councilor Bumgarner? Aye. Councilor Franco? Aye. Councilor Obrey? Aye. Councilor Bordelon? Aye. Councilor Melendez? Aye. Councilor Zafari? Aye. And Granitoski is an aye as well. That is passed unanimously. Seven in favor, zero opposed, zero abstentions. I will entertain a motion to adjourn the, uh, the special town council meeting. So moved. moved Second. By Gardner, seconded by Franco. All those in favor of adjourning the special town council meeting, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? So moved unanimously. Uh, the special council meeting is adjourned at 6.50 p.m. Okay. We are reconvening the cow at 6.50. Give me one second, please. Okay. And we are on to item 5B. This is 2021-116 King Property Renaming, Sassicus Nature Preserve on page 28. And Councilor Zapari, could you take that one for us, please? I make a motion to recommend a resolution to approve the changing of the name of the King property to Sassicus Nature Preserve. Second. I so move. Moved by Zapari, seconded by Bumgardner. And we received um, quite a bit of information in our packet, and I'd like to thank Mr. Barry for providing all the background information for us. Did you wish to speak to anything in particular, Mr. Barry, or are you just here for questions? Uh, just here for questions. Thank you very much for joining us. Do any of the counselors have questions on this item? Councilor Obrey? I just had one question, and I apologize for the fact I didn't have a chance to look into it myself. But um, the, it was referred to before as the King property. Was that just the people that had owned it in the past, or was it King's property? It's my understanding that that was the previous owner. The last name was King. Okay. Did anybody ever look to see if it was the King's property? The, it, it may I that. jump in? Yeah. There, at some point, we were provided with a copy of the deed. I don't know if it was in this packet or another packet. I saw it somewhere. And um, the, the person who had transferred the property over his last name was King. Okay. Thank you. Just want to make sure <laughs> we weren't making a mistake there. But you did a very nice job with it. I do appreciate it. I just wanted to thank the, um, the groups that worked together to blaze the trail on that. That was very nice for the western part of town. Councilor Bordelon, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm excited for this property. I think it, it's great to look at renaming uh, this, and I hope that the tradition continues as we move to the Wolf property as well. Um, I think this is a great starting point, and, you know, with a name like that, um, for a property in its in you know entirety, it's important to consider down the road looking to achieve grants and funding to clean up the property and remediate the still uh, bullet points that are on this property that need remediation that are still contaminated, and I think that would drive the point home in its full preservation of the property. So I hope as we rename this, we also reflect bringing that land back full circle and looking at the ways that we can apply for funding to clean that property to make sure that it can be cherished for years to come. Um, it is along a water point and uh, the contamination is seeping in that area. Some of the, the bullet points in this property have been um, identified, but some of the recommendations have yet to be um, addressed in its entirety. So I appreciate the name. I think it's a great initiative. I appreciate you, you know, spearheading this and being part of, you know, making sure it happens and all the folks that have reached out. So I'm in full support of this. Thank you. Mr. Berry, did you just want to address any of that? as far as the contamination on the property? 
And just to mention, I have been talking uh, with uh, Greg Hanover, the public works director. We are looking at that and at options. Um, there's not typically grant, brownfield dollars aren't typically available for this type of property without an economic development component, um, as in jobs. But um, I, there, I don't anticipate them being very, uh, or knock on wood, uh, very large items. So we are looking at that. So we'll be back as a possible CIP. And the other, the other thing to note is that it was accepted um, by various organizations with ten, within town as an as a, uh, appropriate piece of open space, um, given the condition of the property. And I don't think they would have done that if it was in that dire of shape. Yeah. Mr. Burke? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Deep also reviewed the full environmental and found it to be fairly minor things that, that were remaining out there. Yes. But still, I, point taken, we should still wrap it up. Yes. May I respond? Are there any other counselors that wish to speak a first time? Thank you. So um, just in response excuse to your me, comment. Excuse me. Oh, I thought you acknowledged me. No, I did oh, not. Sorry. Councilor Baumgartner. My apologies. I'll yield the floor if you have a follow No, no, go. To, I, I thought she looked my way. I thought she was giving me the floor. I apologize. I was looking around. Councilor Baumgartner. Um, thank you. I just want to uh, thank all of those involved, in particular uh, Parks and Recreation team. Um, certainly, you know, the folks that have trailblazed, um, as many, many may know, um, just a few years ago, the King property became open space as a result of the land swap um, that we had at, um, once we built uh, the new middle school at the Merritt property. Um, and um, as a result, uh, we now have uh, trails because of the, those trailblazing efforts on uh, the part of many volunteers in our community. And um, again, very appreciative of their efforts. But um, you know, it goes without question. Our council has been committed to uh, supporting open space acquisition. Um, and you know, I've spoken to countless individuals in our community who have really enjoyed um, you know the, the new trails there. Um, big thank you to the Tribal Council, uh, Mashantucky Pequot Tribal Council, um, and the Elders Council for uh, recon recommending this name, uh, Sasakis, who is the one of the uh, 17th century uh, Grand Sachems uh, of the Pequot Tribe. Um, he was the tribe. Uh, he was the tribal leader uh, during the Pequot massacre, um, and um, you know a very important figure to uh, the uh, Pequot Tribe. And so, it is quite fitting. We we appreciate this recommendation uh, and it is my hope that moving forward uh, we can continue working with um, the Meshantucka Pequot tribe, the Eastern Pequot tribe, the Mohegan tribe uh, who again are, are the original stewards on, on the land in which we live um, and so uh, you know certainly would agree with Councilor Bordelon you know if, to an extent we can um, remediate property would certainly support support that um, but um, you know here to certainly celebrate this name change um, and uh, you know I look forward to voting yes tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Any other first time speakers? Councilor Bordelon, you have the floor for your second time. Thank you. So just in response um, to a comment that was made that, you know, some people would not recommend this property if it was not in the greatest shape. That's not my intent nor my what I was stating. I was just simply mm -hmm. stating that I'd like to see the property. It's one of the only <coughs> open space properties in its capacity on a certain section of town. And it does have uh, lead, arsenic, and many other things that are still leaching out that have not been addressed in the full report. Um, so to say that that's minor is maybe to some, but to me, it's still having a longstanding environmental I impact. And I just would love to see that property um, truly preserved in, it, in its full capacity if we can. So thank you. Any other counselors? All right, we will vote on 2021-116 King Property Renaming. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? So move unanimously, thank you. We are on to 2021-399 Community Outreach Specialist Job Description. Thank you, Mr. Berry. Um, and this begins on page 33 in your packet. And let's see. I apologize. And just to mention, uh, Chief Pissarro will eventually be here. He had a, a treat fall in his wife's grandmother's power lines, and he had to go over and do some stuff there. But uh, I know he's on the, planning to be here at some point. Okay. I'll answer when I can. I'm sure you can you can speak to it, sir. Um, so we are back to Councilor Bumgarner, I believe, for 2021-399, please. 
Um, make a motion to approve the Public Safety Community community Outreach Specialist job description. Second. Moved by Baumgartner and seconded by Bordelon. Mr. Burt, did you want to start us off on this? Uh, sure. <clears throat> As you know, the uh, RTM, uh, through their process of looking at some of the options that are available for addressing uh, um, Excuse me. Uh, best interaction between police and community. One of the things mentioned was the possibility of, uh, of a social worker, so some, a softer approach with the community um, than ha automatically just having an officer respond to everything. There are some items that, that could be handled uh, in a more calming manner. Um, through the, through the uh, town council's budget process, the town council did put in a full-time position into the uh, into the budget for this year. However, looking kind of as we got more into it, looking at the uh, what's out there and other uh, kind of comparable positions, we do think it was set a little bit low. So we're looking at um, uh, boosting that salary a little bit to make sure we get someone who's well. We don't want someone right. You know, no offense, but someone right out of college. We, you know, we want the police to understand they have good experience and that they can help guide the police in better handling of issues. Um, and then beyond that, we did you know throw out a broad net looking at what is in other communities out there. We're fairly ahead of the curve, honestly. Um, so we didn't find a ton, but there are some. Some of the bigger cities, of course, have done this already. Now, as we discussed during the budget process, this is sort of a pilot right now. As I mean, obviously, one person can't cover three shifts. Um, you know, it's going to have to be somewhat of a flexible position. Um, one thing, though, that you know we definitely want to use is with the use of body cam footage. You know, when we see interactions, um, this person can also, after the fact, look and give some guidance as to how we might improve things in the future, in similar instances. So I think it'd be great to uh, really improve our, our uh, dialogue and interactions with the community. Could you just speak to the salary differential between what we approved sure. we and had, um, the range? Fogging thing again. <laughs> we had approved. Um, if we look at the last paragraph in the background, we approved fifty thousand. And right, and this budget. is asking for. It. Uh, and then this is also looking at our pay scale too, at comparable positions uh, at our adopted uh, pay scales. So we're looking at fifty-seven thousand four hundred one to seventy-two thousand six twelve. Um, depending on how much experience they have. And uh, we're not asking for more money tonight. We're asking for the, because uh, of course we're late in hiring this position, so the money will be there this year, but we are asking to be set at that salary range. Thank you for addressing that. Councilor Zaferi, have the floor, sir. I, I, I apologize that I, I'm not hearing well. There's some reverberation in the uh, uh, sound reflection on our current format. But we just talked about there already being a, a salary position of $50,000 for a social worker. Is this, this new position to replace that that social worker that was in the budget for this, 2022? This is, yeah, this is that position just um, asking to increase the salary. It's the same position. We haven't filled it yet. Okay, so it's not an additional employee. No. It's an employee with, with more responsibility and better uh, background. Is that right? That's the hope with, with the salary, yes. We didn't have a job description until now. We approved a position and the budget and 50000 And now as we've been able to write the job description and look at what else is out there, um, this is a request so that we can get a qualified person. Okay, okay. Thank you. Councilor Overy and then Bordelon. Uh, I'm sure when you're doing this, there'll be a lot of things that you're looking at, but I was, I'm hopeful that maybe uh, if this person is not trained already for working with uh, some adults with, um, oh, I don't know exactly what the words are, but I know they've done the training in the city. Autism and they are, spectrum. I'm sorry? The autism spectrum? The aut mm -hmm. autism spectrum. I'm hoping that we could take advantage of that and be sure that this person is trained with that. I think it would be uh, an excellent idea. Yeah, 100% yeah, agree. Okay, thank you. Councilor Borderline. 
Um, I know that in the past, when I first joined the council a couple years ago, one of the things, um, and then the DEI committee came on board, and but one of the strong things I was for is definitely looking at ways to make sure we're diversifying our community. And, um, you know, so I'm hoping, you know, I know right now we do not have, you're acting HR, is that correct, John? We, yes, who's gonna be yes split between, I mean, a lot of it's done by Kathy right. Lee, but yes. So I hope we don't lose the vision as we're still looking to fill that position and uh, make sure that we are, you know, definitely looking to diversify. I think it's one thing to fill a position, but obviously we want qualified candidates, but I think it would be really important and, and be another addition. I know it has been spoken in the past that the city of Groton has a much more diverse uh, police force than the town of Groton, and this would be a great opportunity to infiltrate, you know, and kind of have that accessibility on a different scale. And I, I think this would be a great position to consider and recruit. So, uh, also making sure that we're looking at females um, as well. So, um, so the increased range is what you're thinking of the projection for this p position over the lifespan of that position up to 72 or? Yeah, of course, over time, you know, I think the last time, um, for instance, a non-union pay scale uh, was set was in 17, you know, every, you know, whatever it was, eight, 10 years, whatever, it gets reset. So, you know, it won't say that forever and ever, it'll eventually, but that's currently, until the council adopts something else, that would be the range. So that would be the top end on that top number. But at some point, of course, inflation catches up in the council. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll go through a process of looking at salaries. Nice. And, and my last question that I and I read the um, the job description. It'd be interesting or helpful, if possible, to consider maybe also putting something in there that this um, social worker could be used to assist the school uh, youth officers in in the event that there's something needed during the day. Right. Um, there are counselors on hand, but sometimes <laughs> there's been some incidents at the high school and there need extra um, backup. So if the cops or are called to the high school for an incident, it would be nice to have this social worker that is also trained in that area to accompany. So mm -hmm. um, I think adding a line working with our youth as well in there um, and, and collaboration with the school system. Yeah, yeah it would definitely a, be available to any of our officers, including our school resource officers. Yeah. yeah. So I just want to make sure that that would be an open part of that is to um, have it um, available to our, our schools. So is there a way that we should add that in here or? I mean, it's, it, it already, can, you know, it's already will be, you know, for any of our officers and wherever they're directed. But I mean, <coughs> either way, whatever the council wants to do. Well, I mean, I think it would be interesting to have it in there for a job description, the job description in there to state that also working collectively with our school systems in some capacity. Yeah, I, I would gladly add that. Thank you. Councillor Bumgarner and then Franco. Thank you. Um, certainly support establishing a social worker uh, position within the police department. Um, certainly any opportunity we can have um, to, you know, support um, really nonviolent or non, um, you know, uh, confrontational means to deescalate. Um, you know, crises uh, in our community ought to be explored and, and supported. Um, so certainly support, you know, our, um, um, we'll support, be supporting this tonight. Um, my question is, I, I don't know all too well the qualifications of being a social worker. I understand that there are some um, accreditations and, um, you know, uh, qualifications that some folks um, have to have in order to be considered a social worker. And, and my question is, that based off of this job description, would they meet that um, uh, that definition of, of being a social worker. Yeah, so we, we also have, you know, a social worker position that's different than this, but similar, similar qualifications in our uh, in our uh, human services department. So we do have something to go off of. Um, but yeah, it, it, it would be it. Excellent. And, and then also, uh, of course, you know, as we're looking at applications, we would also look at what all credit, you know, looking to have they had experience with youth, have they had, you know, 
it's great to have more accreditations or other experience. So, Wonderful. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really happy to hear that um, it's the intention to use this individual uh, to review body camera footage. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's that's absolutely great. And, um, you know, it's my hope over time. Um, you know, certainly this is a, a gr great first step, but, you know, I, ideally getting uh, at least one social worker on every shift, um, you know, that way we don't obviously overtax that one individual either. Um, so uh, I had the same problem with my phone earlier. Um, no, I said, no, 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 no. So, uh, nothing further. Thank you. I was just going to ask if everyone could silence their Sorry. devices. I wasn't sure who that was or where it was coming from, but I keep it hearing a, a dinging. Couple, a couple um, minutes ago. <laughs> were you all set? It was, it was oh, yes. distracting. Oh, yes. It was on during the whole time. <laughs> yeah, blame him, right? Uh, Councilor Franco, please. Thank you. I am um, very happy with this position and the job right up. I um, I want to notate that the incumbent will work to assess citizens' needs and provide intervention and follow-up services as appropriate to assist client and or families with issues, which may include but are not limited to domestic violence, homelessness, mental health, chronic illness, substance abuse, loss of job, poverty, suicide, serious motor vehicle accidents, house fire, personal and family adjustment, and criminal behavior, and promote the physical and mental health and the wellness of residents in crisis. Triage, triage social services and mental health needs, deliver direct services and advocacy, and maintain a strong focus on assertive community outreach and intervention, and may liaison with work with partner law enforcement agencies and other community partners. And I think right there with, with reading that sums up why I think this position will help in so many different great ways, and I'm absolutely in favor of this, and I'm very happy that we're going forward with it. Thank you. Yeah. And I would note that that seems to cover the concerns about working with the schools as well, because of the community partners. Just Mr. want to mention that, I, you know, I really commend the council on uh, adding this position. I, I, this is one of the things I'm most excited about that we've done since I've been here. I, you know, I think it's a great opportunity, and I'm excited to see where it goes in the future. Any other first-time hands before we go to second-time speakers? Councilor Bordelon, for your second time. Thank you. I just think it's important, too, to thank the, the um, RTM for, I mean, we really propelled ourselves into this by an action of the RTM members who felt very strongly about looking at ways to bring forward an initiative. And that's how the council, even though we were the final action on that, it was grassroots effort from um, you know diverse group of folks in um, many different districts who got to this point. So you know I think it's important as we as councilors will vote this in. I think it's really awesome to see the folks that have served on that uh, committee that uh, spoke and uh, brought the the initiative forward to us um, to to vote on. So I just think it's really important. And, and also, Sim Evans, the moderator, for um, allowing the RTM members to have a voice and enacting and listening and advocating and uh, encouraging them to you know, use their voice and allow for a committee as such to move forward to get to this point. So thanks to them. Any other first-time speakers? Councilor Franco, for your second time. I would also like to thank the police department for actually meeting with some um, of the counselors as well as RTM members and having discussions and um, hearing some of their input as well as the community at large with having that I've had conversations with who helped lead and direct me into this, um, this position and bringing it forward and helping bringing it through over to the RTM. And I thank the police department and the town of Groton and um, their insight and the community at large. So thank you. All right, seeing no other hands, we will vote on 2021-399 Community Outreach Specialist Job Description. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? So moved unanimously with seven counselors. Thank you. Notify the chief that he doesn't have to leave the down tree. All right, we are on to 2021-725 Sustainability and Resilience Manager job description. Um, I apologize, I keep losing track of who spoke last. Give me one second, please. All right, so this will be Councillor Franco. This is on page 36, please. 
Make a motion to recommend a resolution to approve the sustainability and reliability reliability manager draft description. I so move. Second. second. I'm, I'm taking the second. Thank you. <laughs> moved by Grant. Moved by Franco. Seconded by Granatowski. Can we third? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. This is something we have been working on for a long time. And I'm pleased to say we're finally moving ahead with it. And I am sorry that I won't be around to see the hire, but I trust that whoever is here after me uh, will will find a good person to fill this position. Mr. Burb? And can I first ask Mr. Greeley to promote uh, Mr. Reiner? Have you already? Excellent. Okay, good. Good okay, evening, good. Mr. Reiner. <laughs> good evening, everyone. Uh, John Reiner, Director of Planning and Development Services. Did you wish uh, to speak to this? Very briefly, I can just talk about the job description. Um, I think pretty straightforward. It's a non-union, 40-hour-a-week position. Uh, we are looking for a seasoned professional. Uh, this uh, person will be part of the management team within the uh, Department of Planning and Development Services and really looking for this person to move forward with the development and implementation of a, really a sustainability action plan for the town and all that goes with that. I'm happy to talk about any specifics, but you know, uh, we've already been getting the word out there and trying to do some soft recruiting to our different networks because there are a lot of municipalities and organizations that are looking for similar positions now. Thank you, Mr. Reiner. Any counselors have questions? Councilor Baumgartner. Yes, uh, I too stand in a strong support of um, this uh, position. We obviously uh, voted for uh, this, uh, the funding for this position uh, in our last budget cycle. Um, and uh, my question is really for uh, Mr. Burt, um, but um, I understand that in previous uh, iterations of the either the job description or uh, the explaining of uh, Councillor Bumgarner, can you give it yeah, one second? I'm Mr. Sorry. Burt wasn't here when you started no, your question. Okay. Mr. Burt, this question is for you. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, you know I, I know now. Obviously, this is a fully fleshed out uh, job description. Um, my question is. Uh, you know, considering that it is a position that will require uh, the breaking down of silos, working, you know, with, across multiple um, departments within our town, especially public works, um, it, would it be more appropriate for this position to report directly to you uh, as opposed to the, the Planning and Development Department? Part, you know, of course, right now we honestly do not have silos that, you know, I know that was kind of a case in the past, but I mean, obviously that could happen again in the future, but not while I'm here. Um, part of the reason it's over there is, you know, those are the two for planning and public works are the two departments they'll, you know, they'll overwhelmingly be working with um, compared to other departments. That's where it, basically the, the space is for them. And I, it, you know, I honestly, uh, you know, with just me and Lisa, I don't have the staffing to spend a lot, you know, a lot of time directing. That's why I really need help with that. Um, so in the absence of having an assistant town manager, it'd be hard for me to take that position on. It could always, you know, it could always be changed in the future. It doesn't mean it has to stay there forever either. We can see how it goes. So it, um, okay, so, all right. Um, and then outside of that, so then I see uh, just minimum qualifications, master's degree in planning, environmental science, sustainability, and sustainable business. Uh, um, so yeah, I really outside of that, I think it, it looks great and certainly want to commend the, um, uh, the uh, resili uh, Resilience and Sustainability Task Force for uh, their advocacy for this position and their uh, continued work. Um, um, within our task force to advocate for a better, um, you know, a, a more resilient community. So thank you to the chair, uh, Mr. Stever, for being here as well. Um, and uh, no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Burt, did you want to reply to something? I just wanted to concur with that, but also mention that um, uh, especially Mr. Z uh, um, uh, Ziever, um, Could you speak up just a little? Oh, sorry, I just wanted to. I wanted to agree with Ms. Uh, Councillor Baumgartner, and also uh, um, mention that the Resilience Committee put it. I actually reviewed the description earlier. This has been ongoing for a long time for this description. They gave some great input and um, helped to really guide this position. Um, 
I'm going to speak at this point. Um, I concur with the statements regarding the work that our volunteers have done. Um, the Resilience and Sustainability Task Force have um, done a lot of work for the town already, um, but they need someone on staff to start pursuing specific items for us. They need someone on staff to start pursuing funding to take on some of these projects that we have talked about doing in the past. So I, I am really happy that we are finally moving this forward and I look forward to um, the time when I'm watching a council meeting and we'll see the new sustainability physician manager sitting in front of us. Perhaps a, a young woman on staff would be here to, um, yeah. to represent and uh, start pushing Groton forward. We really need to not delay any longer on this and there are so many things that can be done and um, I look forward to the opportunities that await the community. Thank you. Councilor Obrey. Um, I just want to say I think it's most appropriate that this be in planning and zoning. Many of the items, if you read these, those are the expertise that this person is going to need to be able to wrap around some of the things that are going to be asked to be done. Um, I don't, I, I feel that our manager's position is to be the overseer of all our departments and not the creator of one. And I think this is an excellent movement. I think it'll be um, uh, very productive. We are very fortunate in having the group that we do have that are very interested in making this happen. Sorry it's taken so long to get to the fact of where we're really going to hire somebody. But I just want to say again, I think it's absolutely appropriate that it go to planning and zoning and work in conjunction with other people that understand what we're trying to do with this process. Okay, seeing no other hands, we will vote was, on 20. I had my hand up. I didn't see. That's okay. Councilor Bordelon, thank you. Floor. Um, Thank you. Um, I think this is really exciting for the town, uh, being a coastal community, and really wanting to make changes, you know, in our environment on a coastal level. As I, you know, constantly have supported um, actions in this town to make sure that we're looking and viewing the town through an environmental lens. So I'm excited for this, and I'm excited to see where this will take us and what type of collaboration and grants. Um, and different things that they're able to do and bring into the town. Um, I hope the group that has volunteered that has been, you know, big voices in this town looking at ways um, and the needs of our town might even have um, a voice in, you know, looking um, when we finalize this position um, whenever and however that may be. Um, but there's definitely a need and there's folks, you know, I was just looking this up tonight when I was reviewing my packet for the second time, uh, a lot of graduates going to school for this exact thing and it's a definitely a moving um, important piece and we, you know, hope, hopefully we'll get somebody that's um, really excited that's going to come in and be around for a while and really be able to um, direct our town in the right directions um, looking into the near future. So I'm excited and um, I think this is exactly what Broughton needs and the right direction for our town. Thank you. Any other first time speakers before we go to second time? Councilor Baumgartner? Yes, uh, just quickly, I, I read, um, at, uh, Sen Senator Murphy put out a statement that at Groton, um, he serves on the Appropriations Committee in the Senate, and Groton um, should the Senate pass an appropriations bill, their, their budget bill, um, will be set to receive $725,000 for uh, resiliency projects. Yes. And so, you know, I, I can't stress enough the importance of cultivating and, and strengthening our partners with our, you know, our state and federal stakeholders um, so that we can really maximize the opportunity we have to, um, you know, invest in uh, resiliency um, and, and certainly our infrastructure. And um, certainly, you know, I think that those fund, those, those 
uh, that additional funding will enable um, whomever serves in this role to have you know shovel ready projects and hit the ground running so um, to the extent that we can to you know support right our congress people or you know congressman courtney senator blumenthal and murphy and say yes you know let's let's pass these bills in washington to so we can you know help out um, you know this cause here back at home is very important uh, thank you excellent all right, we will vote on 2021-725 Sustainability and Resilience Manager job description. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? So moved unanimously. With seven counselors, excellent. We are on to 2021-103. Uh, excess Property Redevelopment, Pleasant Valley School Property RFP. This is on page 40, and I'm assuming Mr. Reiner is here for this. Um, and this is for council discussion. Um, Mr. Burt, you're looking for direction from the council tonight before I turn it over to Mr. Reiner and Mr. Bronk? At least, uh, you know, at least initial steps. Um, you know, obviously this could be, I'm not sure how large a conversation is going to be, but we are at an impasse right now in terms of our, First, uh, our preferred developer is no longer with the project, as you all know. Um, there are a couple options out there. You could go with the second developer. You could um, totally redo the RFP process. And then as part of the RFP process, if you chose to redo it, you could also look at you know things involving uh, park space, that type of thing. Um, but uh, Mr. Reiner probably has things he wants to add to that, so I'll let him. Uh, Okay, so just be, before we go any further, if you look on page 40, there are three alternatives here. Um, the first is recommend staff to issue the RFP with changes. The second, recommend staff to make changes to the RFP and to bring back to the town council for review and approval or no action whatsoever. So those are the three options that they prevented, presented to us. Of course, that doesn't mean we're limited by those, but these are just several alternatives that we have. So Mr. Reiner or Mr. Bronk, would you like to lead us on this? I'm not sure who would, who would like to begin, but thank you for joining us again, both of you. Uh, thank you, uh, John Reiner. Again, I can start with this a little bit, and uh, Paige can also assist. So, uh, again, as John said, the uh, initial recommendation that the committee made of the potential preferred developer has backed out, and we've discussed this with the council, and they've given us uh, previous direction to re release the RFP. And prior to us moving forward with that, there were really a few specific questions that we wanted to get some uh, some clear direction on the council from. I know that there's been some concerns uh, and uh, some thought about uh, additional park space in this area of town, which um, we can dive into some of the details on that a little bit, which we'll want to talk about. Um, getting some really specific information on what the council is looking for as it relates to background checks, because there's a whole gamut of things that we can do on that and what we want to have in uh, this RFP moving forward as well as future ones. Um, the makeup of the selection committee, which I think we have some ideas based upon a conversation that we've had at the previous count meeting. And then if there are any other uh, changes to the RFP based upon uh, members of the council reviewing it. So um, I think specifically uh, for the first item I uh, had brought up with having uh, a portion of the property to be designated and built by the developer as open to the public park or open space or a playground area. Uh, in talking with our Parks and Recreation Director, as well as um, one of the consultants that's been doing work uh, for Parks and Rec for a long time, Kent and Frost, uh, and some work for us. You know, we thought for this particular piece of property, probably the most appropriate um, use of public space out there would be some type of a playground area. Uh, as well as potentially if there's any open land and trails that could be incorporated into the development, making that part of something that's open and accessible uh, to people from the, the town at large. And as we're going through this, 
something that we could put in the RFP is not to be so specific to exactly what we're looking for, but that all propose, you know, draft language or language to the effect of, you know, all proposals shall include um, open space or public playground park space that shall be open to all members of the community, not limited to, et cetera. So that's something that we can talk about a little bit. Um, and something also along those lines that we've uh, discussed a little bit, the not to uh, give too much away as far as, as future negotiations go, but some of the numbers that we were talking about that uh, some of the offers that were on the table were pretty substantial for the sale of this property and something that we could do because this is such a great property from a development perspective. It's uh, on a busy roadway. It has access to water and sewer. Not necessarily the ideal place for uh, a large scale field or park complex, but instead to take some of the proceeds from the sale of this very developable piece of property and look for other properties around the area that could be developed into smaller pocket parks, uh, playground areas, and open space. So I think we could kind of uh, get that from. Well, Mr. Reiner is frozen. Um, I'm just going to take the opportunity to note that Councillor Parker arrived at 726 and we are at eight councillors. Is the whole feed frozen or is it just Mr. Reiner? The whole feed. Um, Mr. Greeley, the, the feed appears to be frozen. Do you want to let the police chief know that we've done his? Um, Mr. Uh, chief Fasaro is here. Um, I'm assuming he's here for the other yeah. items okay. as well. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Reiner is back. Thank you. <laughs> so you froze, Sorry, uh, you froze up when you were talking um, about the potential for other properties and pocket parks, et cetera, and then you froze. So. Okay. I, I think that was about it okay. um, on that <laughs> item. So I, I think it would be good to get some feedback on that particular item before we move on to the uh, other options. Okay. So then why don't we handle this kind of how we handled um, that other, the committee we were working on before. So we've got four bullets here um, on page 40. Thank you, Councilor Parker. We are on page 40, 2021 access property redevelopment. We've just begun. So if everybody sees, um, it says prior to releasing a revised RFP, staff is seeking direction from the town council on a number of items. And Mr. Reiner just reviewed the first one and we've lost Mr. Reiner. Um, the specific requirements or language regarding the requirements for a portion of the property be, to be designed and built by the developer as open to the public park, open space, or playground area. And Mr. Reiner added in or trail. Is, there he is, he's back. <laughs> Um, is there, I wonder if it's the weather, if the weather's really bad, if that's why we keep losing you. Getting strong winds? Actually, I was there that time. I just, uh, I can uh, camera off for one second as I was having a drink. <laughs> oh, okay. um, so just let's take this one bullet at a time. Is there consensus that, um, that we all agree with that first bullet? Is there any um, opposition to the first bullet, what Mr. Mr. Reiner was stating? Councilor Overy? Well, I think that this is a, is a good idea, but it really depends on the property and what the developer has to do to the property to make it so that it could be built on. Um, an example of that would be William Seeley School. Um, I don't think there was any large amount of money exchanged because the developer took on the responsibility of taking down the school, getting rid of uh, what had to be disposed of, et cetera. So uh, um, it, it's, it, it, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself on this one. It used to be that if you did as some sort of a project, and I was involved in many of them, you had to do a play area or whatever, Groton, uh, Groton Heights, uh, Bridgewater, uh, the Meadows, all those different developments, the developer had to do an area that, and had to put in very expensive equipment, which is still there. I don't know who takes care of it now, but it's still there and all the different ones that I was involved in. So I think that uh, this is good, but it's going to depend on there's a lot there's a lot of things that come to play in a transaction and uh, we can certainly hope that we can work something out like that but I think we have to be um, 
we have to be aware of what the that's not a pure site that's a problem site because you have contaminants in those buildings so it's a it's a bigger question so that's my thought on number one okay Councilor Franco I would like if we, it depends like uh, Councilor Obrey said it depends on what goes there so if you have a manufacturer that comes in and builds a big building with manufacturing are you gonna put a playground next to a big manufacturing building that has a lot of industrial uses going on possibly so these are things that you can't just simply say this is what we want in this property I think it would be nice if whatever developed there that a community may not feel comfortable even if it's an apartment complex just say bringing their family into an apartment complex to go play on their playground I would prefer if they would purchase some other property within the neighborhood the adjoining neighborhood for the whole community to go into that and play there or have open space or a public park there because um, then it would feel like it was separate from whatever is going on in that whatever is going to be developed there um, I would prefer a separate area not on there and then also because we're selling it and it's coming at such a premium price to then tell somebody, by the way, you're going to develop like manufacturing here, and then you have to put a playground in the middle of it or, or on the side of it. It just doesn't seem right to me. So I would prefer it to be in the neighborhood, and it would actually feel like a community park. Thank you. Okay, so we have two opposed to the first bullet. Then is that what I'm hearing? Um, Councilor Overy and uh, Councilor Franco. Yes. I oppose it to be on their site and making them do it, yes, but I okay. do want those just somewhere else. Okay. Um, Councilor Bordelon, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Um, for me, I mean, we could go bullet by bullet, but I think the three recommendations, all alternatives, um, these are all great things to talk about because I think it's hard for me to say which bullet I'm for if I'm leaning towards recommendation number two, which is recommend staff to make changes to the RFP and bring it back to the town council for review and approval and invite back the other developers that did not were not the preferred developers. I think that'd be great. But I, I think that's so it's kind of hard for me to pick between these four. I kind of think two kind of says that, like, bring it back, relook. So. Um, that's kind of where I think it should go. Um, and that would give us a chance then to discuss some of the things like Councillor Franco stated about the park being embedded depending on what is actually developed there or not. Um, so it's kind of hard to pick apart the four bullets in its entirety for me if, if number two is my option. So um, I'm having a little trouble doing that with that consensus part versus just voting on what we want to do and talking about the bullets. Um, but I, I think it's hard to do a consensus on something like this because we can cons you know say on these things but at the end we're voting on the three individual things right but so i just want to make sure i'm understanding but if if you are leaning towards the second one the staff needs to know what changes you're interested in them making so that's why they need to hear from you tonight right as to what the objections are and councillors Obrey and franco have raised their concerns that's why we need to flush out each of the bullets um, because if we're going to send it back and ask them for changes, they need to know what changes we want. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, this will be just be delayed and delayed and delayed, and we'll never get the property listed again. Right, and I think we're in the process of looking at how we're going to redevelop our RFPs, and so that's what I'm saying is I think looking at the makeup of it and re you know revisiting all of this, then talk about parks in general, about open space, and how we're doing our whole process as a whole would be, um, you know, what I would be looking at. So. So bullet one, I think it can go either way, depending on what's there and how we're going to write our RFP and what development we're putting out and what type of RFP we're putting out. I think open safe space should be there. So if it's not there, maybe it's in the neighborhood right behind it. At the, if looking at the map, it kind of, there's a piece that kind of points off. So maybe over here, you know, there'd be access. I mean, there's a lot of options. So, um, I mean, bullet point one could go either way, depending on the development. That's all I have for now. Councilor Baumgartner. Yes, uh, I support specific language um, requiring that land there be utilized for whether it be open space or recreational space for um, kids or families. Um, I think, and I, I don't want to speak for the council, but I, I assume that was a part of our collective decision or a, a, a piece of our collective decision to go back to the drawing board as there were some folks who had 
um, written to us, including folks who do live within that district, uh, that it's important to maintain uh, those uh, spaces um, it, at that school should we develop it into housing. Um, you know, and, and plans that, you know, we have seen in particular, um, you know, that may have been lacking. So, you know, I hope we do include that um, in, you know, in this uh, RFP moving forward. Uh, Mr. Bronk, did you wish to speak at this point? Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate the conversation and I think it's helpful in gaining some direction. Um, we as staff can craft the RFP however council desires. Uh, the, a copy of the draft RFP is included in your packet and it's fairly comprehensive, but um, it, it does help, I think, when we're attracting development interests and in trying to be as clear as possible and reducing ambiguity to the developer. Um, in dealing with development proposals in the past, when we change situations where we demand something that's not referenced in the RFP or there's a change of uh, understanding that always creates problems in advancing discussions. So the, the exact point as to whether we carve out a piece of the town-owned property or we intend on using the proceeds to purchase other property, that's a pretty significant difference. And I, I think it would be helpful if we did get some clarity at some point as to which direction we would like to go on that. Clearly, the neighborhood is expressed that they, they would like increased um, uh, park usage and recreation. We've heard that loud and clear, but are we going to keep it on this property or are we going to do it elsewhere? That's a pretty significant distinction. Uh, we're going to need some clarification on that before the RFP goes final. Thank you, Mr. Bronk. Um, I'm going to take an opportunity at this point. Um, I, I agree that um, we should specify that we would like either open space or playground area included in the RFP. I would prefer that we do, as you, I think you use the term, a carve out for a section of the property. Perhaps the area that is currently the playground could just be resurrected as a nice new take care of paying for the um, equipment on that playground. But I prefer that we do that and we keep it in that area. Um, I think it should be noted in the RFP when we release it that we are expecting um, something for the community, as Councillor Obrey stated. Um, while this is a property that may have some concerns as far as taking it down, um, it is a prime piece of real estate that um, I think they will be very happy to have in that area. I don't think they'd have any trouble renting um, living space there um, because of its locale. Um, and I do think it is reasonable to expect that they would do something for the community. So I am in favor, um, I concur with Councilor Baumgartner as to um, including open space or playground area as part of the RFP. Um, we haven't heard from, uh, let's give the opportunity for first time speakers and then we'll go back because we have several councilors that wish to speak twice. So any other first time speakers? I'm looking for councilors at Perry, I don't see a hand. Councilor Parker, okay. Councilor Bordel, I wanted to speak, and then Councilor Franco. Thank you. I think it actually would do us some justice to actually include both. There's a way that we can put the language in there, and because I'm a firm believer in open space, but I think the cry from the neighborhood in that area and the folks having it, we haven't reassessed to ask them would they mind it if it was moved a little bit off the main road and maybe in a different area. So I think there's a way that we could actually achieve both uh, aspects of this by putting the language in both and we work out the fine details as we move through the development agreement for that area. So there could be language that states exactly what is here, but also maybe um, there might be an opportunity to um, you know, resurrect uh, open space somewhere around that community. Um, but I think we need to bring it back to the drawing board and I think bringing the public back around the table now that the developer is no longer on board and kind of asking 
did you really want the open space on this area with the high industrial or would, it, would you be comparable to move it elsewhere? So I think if we keep both options in here, it leaves us available and ready to do whatever will fit um, based on what comes down the pipe down the road. I also think we should be going back to the community and allowing them to be part of this discussion. It would be great to have had this in collaboration after some type of public comment or um, you know, a chance for the community to react so we could hear their comments tonight. But um, so with that, I think adding both doesn't, uh, in, you know, Oh, it allows us to have both options on the table. When you say add both, what do you mean? So, so, so I'm, I'm saying that the, the, the bullet one and the option to have um, the portion of the property be designed and built uh, by the developer on open, all of it, like what was discussed, meaning on the property or off the property if that in that same district area location. So you so, favor bullet one? I favor bullet one if the language, I the wording on this kind of, I also think it should also say, and um, uh, community input. So if we're doing this for the community, I think we need to bring them back around to discuss how we want to achieve that open space that they spoke of. So I think it's hard today when we don't have the chance and the availability for folks from that area to speak on behalf of their area and location. And that was one of the other things they wanted. It was an opportunity to be around at the table. That's one of the things we're also talking about uh, looking at our RFP developments is having community input before we make decisions as a council. So I think it is important that we have that chance to do that and we have not. So I, I'm having trouble like weaseling this down and limiting things without knowing. So, so my question is, John, is there a way that we can have some public input on this? I mean, that's entirely up to the council. I think so. John, uh, Mr. So I, I'm in favor of public input to be part of this process in RFP development. I think having the public around the table to discuss th the planning of building a new RFP for that area, I think it's important to bring our community at large before us. Thank you. Um, Mr. Reiner, I see you have your hand up. Did you wish to speak at this point, sir? If not, I'll go to other councilors. I just wanted to bring up uh, two quick things. One, uh, a comment that uh, Councilor Overy had uh, said, all multifamily development, all new multifamily development does have a component of uh, recreation land associated with the new development, but that land is usually not open to the public. So I just, that's something that happens with all multifamily, but isn't necessarily open to the public. So if we were asking the developer to do something to the, for the public, that would be in addition to. Um, and if we were looking to have a developer build something either on site or off site, uh, for some type of public use on this property or adjacent to it, um, I would just discourage that we specifically carve out a specific area because that might then limit the development, but instead to give them the creativity that has to be a, uh, to come up with a plan that also um, the council, the way that we do all these contracts is that the council has to approve of the initial and of the final design of the plan of what the developer uh, brings forward prior to them submitting it to the Planning and Zoning Commission so that the, the next council would have a bite at that apple too. Thank you, Mr. Reiner. Thank you. Um, we have two councilors who haven't expressed an opinion on this, do, or actually three councilors, Councilors Perry, Melendez, and Parker. Do you wish to weigh in on the first bullet? No, Councilor Zapari, did you wish to weigh in on the first bullet? No, thank you. And Councillor Parker? Not at this time. Okay, so at this time then, uh, we'll, we'll go to Councillor Franco for her second time. So what did you, can you repeat what you said about this property and is it conducive to apartment complex? Is that what you said? Or it is not conducive to an apartment, apartment complex? Can, can uh, you? I'm sorry, was that directed at me? Yes. <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, this property is conducive to an apartment complex. What I was uh, saying is that if we cut out a specific area for a playground or a park, that might impede the development as opposed to giving a developer the ability to, to design a park or playground area on the, on the site uh, conducive with how their development is laid out. And since you're a planning expert, is it 
What do you usually think a neighborhood feels if there was an apartment complex? Would they feel comfortable to go into an apartment, apartment complex to use their playground equipment with their children? Or would they feel more comfortable with a playground within their community that it seems to be open to everybody? I, I think the, the, the second option is where you probably see more people uh, utilize it. But I, I do think there might be an opportunity uh, for both. Or maybe the, the, the best option is for some creativity because you know through this conversation, something we could ask a developer to do is to focus on building a small public, you know, park, pocket park, playground, either on site or off site, but within very close proximity. So they might be able to find another piece of property nearby that isn't as um, conducive for high density development like this parcel is. This is zoned for high density multifamily development. And there might be another available property um, not too far from here that would be more of a, uh, a neighborhood park that might be more conducive to some of the neighborhoods in the area. Um, when you send out the RFP, does it specifically say we're looking for an apartment complex or is it open to all types of different um, development on that property? Uh, it's, it's open to all different types of development, but uh, this property is zoned for a multi-family. So let's just say... Other uses are allowed in there. Let's and just they could always request a zone change, but the property is zoned for multi-family. So let's just say, because it's nearby to EB, that a manufacturer, maybe a steel building of some sort, you know, um, wanted to buy the property and put up an industrial building would that be conducive to have a park or a playground next to it? Or possibly UPS or FedEx wanted to have a shipping zone there, a hub. Would that be conducive to have a park there? Are we, are we, we're talking that Pleasant would Valley, not right? Be conducive to a, a public park there. Pleasant yeah. Valley. Okay. Because it's not just for apartment complexes, it could actually have other things come in there. Like right. it could be UPS, it could be FedEx. I just never think of them as being close to EV. That's why I was curious. It's in Groton, meaning it's right. not I like gotcha. in, in I think in the Maine. most important thing that we're trying to avoid is kind of what uh, Mr. Bronk had raised is we don't want to move the goalposts after we've already released the RFP. So there may be some language that we could put in the RFP regarding the town's desire for a small pocket park on this site if it's utilized for a residential development or off-site or other creative opportunities that the developer could come up with that would be approved by the town. When you when a, somebody wants to develop a neighborhood um, development and they have to put aside a certain amount of open space, is that correct? Uh, for most subdivisions, correct. Yes. They can either put aside open space or donate money uh, in lieu of. So why don't we but have... But for multifamily, they actually have to uh, create recreation on-site amenities for their residents. Right. So we haven't heard from... We have talked about par neighborhood parks, but we have not gotten a response from Parks and Rec, and they were going to be working on this to figure out where everywhere in the town that may, we may have a need and the actual locations. So this neighborhood, we don't know where the actual locational need is. I mean, being right next to the main busy road, is that the right location or further inside the neighborhood into a, where it's more residential inside there? We're not really sure. So as you just said, if there was a subdivision, they would either have to do it on site or they'd have to give money in lieu of. So depending on whatever goes on this property, we should probably do the t same type of thing. And I honestly just don't think if you build an apartment complex, people will feel comfortable to bring their children into an apartment complex the same as they would as a neighborhood park. Thank you. I kept hitting the wrong button on this, sorry. Um, okay. I Councilor Melendez. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, um, so 
Um, I think I would prefer, I mean, when we put out the RFP last time, the number one selection was um, housing. So I'm thinking if we put out this request for proposal again, I would prefer that it be another housing development for two reasons. One, it's already zoned for that. And two, we already had a presentation saying how we need so much more housing in Groton, um, you know, to keep up with demand. So. I'm going to work under the assumption that um, a housing development will be um, selected. Um, and, and with that in mind, I, I would definitely be in favor of um, um, the first bullet point, um, you know, giving the, the developer creativity to do with it what they want. I think. The. Um, the property is, is also a great idea, but I think we, we could sort of use the, the, the funds that we raise from selling the property to, to purchase that on our own. So, so we'd get both, and um, yeah, that, that's, that's where I stand right now. Councilor Heat apologizes for missing the meeting. Um, I just needed to see, because we, we are at four in favor of the first bullet, two opposed and two haven't expressed an opinion. So the two that have not expressed an opinion could sway this. So if um, either of you would like to chime in, uh, we can go back to Councillor Baumgartner for a second time. Yes, uh, just two brief comments. Uh, one, um, with respect to what Councillor Bordelon brought up, um, completely share her sentiments on uh, just reviewing kind of the, the, the those four bullet points. I would imagine in the last number four, any other changes to the RFP and selection committee recommendation process as directed by the town council. I think that's probably the area where, you know, we're, we're going to talk about, um, you know, community inputs and certainly hope, you know, your, what you articulated is included in that process. And then in terms of um, what can go on the property, I know there's discussion from Councilor Franco about, you know, the, you know, commercial or different types of uses. I understand that property is zoned as residential residential multi-unit, and um, I guess my question would be, um, as a result of that zoning um, designation, uh, really we are um, confined to choosing residential uh, a, a property with a residential component. Is that correct? Or development with a residential component? And I guess that, that would be a question more for uh, either uh, Paige or John. Did you hear his question? Councilor Baumgartner's question? Do you, is your question that you think this would be more of a residential development than a commercial development? A as it's zoned uh, uh, residential multi-unit? I think the end result will most likely be a multifamily development. That's what we've seen uh, a great interest from developers in Groton. Uh, I think it's fair to say that's most likely what we would see get developed on the property. I could add to that as well in light of the recent housing study that was released that showed the strong demand for housing over the next few years, which was greater than what we anticipated. I think that's going to further drive interest in the limited number of properties that are available for housing development, including town-owned properties. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So at this point, then, um, Madam Mayor, the I, I just had a quick point of clarification. Point of clarification? Yeah. On this bullet point, so there's no way to change it other than what it is. So as we're getting a consensus, I support it the way that it is, but I, I was asking, adding if the, you know, so the will was to have it also in another area. So, so Councilor Wardland, as we go through, you have opportunity to add any other changes, as Councilor Bumgardner pointed out, any other changes to the RFP and the selection committee recommendations that comes down to the fourth bullet point. So at that point, so we you can, can revisit add this one there. But we're going to, we're going to go to with one number one right now. And right now we have, um, a plurality of the council that favors bullet number one. All right, so we're on to bullet number two. Um, specificity on the topics to be reviewed via background checks, such as felonies, misdemeanors, et cetera. What else? I'm not sure quite Excuse what me. we need I, on that, Mr. Reiner. I, think, okay. I don't think other. I asked them and they both declined. 
Um, Mr. Reiner, would you like to comment on what in particular you're looking for for the second bullet? I'm not quite sure I understand. Sure. So um, background checks can go uh, in a lot of different ways in talking with our police chief about this a little bit. Um, what do we want to look for? Do we want um, a standard background check? Are we looking for felonies? Are we looking for misdemeanors? Um, are we looking for a period of time? Are we looking for the past 20 years for their entirety of their lifetime uh, that's part of the public record? Are we looking for internet searches? Not all items come up uh, easily. And depending on the type and level of background check, some things may or may not uh, surface. So, you know, it, it, it not, it, are we looking for speeding tickets or are we looking for things that are um, much larger in, in breadth? And, and that's, we want to make sure we have clear direction on this from the council so that we're meeting expectations. All right, very good. That helps. I think that helps. Councilor Parker. So, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. So on the background checks, yes, look for felonies. Misdemeanors could, uh, I would, would it be possible if Chief Fazaro could come up? Is that a problem? Chief Fazaro, are you okay with coming up to I just the have a quick mic question, first, sir? sir? If that's all right. We're fortunate that he's here this evening because he's here for another item, but uh, we, can, we can pick his brain if that's all right with you. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Chief. Just a quick question about the misdemeanors and doing background checks. This would be similar to, it's not a tax credit report, it would be something else. So misdemeanors, a speeding ticket would be considered a misdemeanor. That's, that's not a crime. That's not a crime. So could you explain what the misdemeanors might be so that everybody a has breach to breach of peace. A simple assault, things of that nature, criminal okay. mischief, those might be uh, misdemeanors. Just right. to, I need to clarify one thing. The police department would not be able to run some of these records checks. Uh, we're able to run through NCIC and the Connecticut uh, criminal justice function, the collect system. We can only run those for criminal justice purposes. We can't use them for pre-employment outside of criminal justice. And that's where I was getting ready to go with that. That's why I want to, uh, the chief to explain it clearly. Mr. Burt wanted to chime in. We do have a company, we, an outside company we use to run these background checks. Um, and another example of a misdemeanor would be bribery. So. I, 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 I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I was gonna say, you know, I don't think we should rule anybody out, but I, I lean towards, the report gives us misdemeanors anyway, so I lean towards, let's see that information and then make a decision from there. So I would also include Google searches, any online internet searches. So definitely felonies, because it could be a very serious felony and we do not want that, because it will look bad for the town. And yeah, so I'm in favor of the backgrounds, felonies, misdemeanors, as he's explained, and knowing that the police cannot look for that information and that you have a company that can pull that information up. So. And Councilor Parker, just to um, go to something that Mr. Reiner was also requesting, how far back do you want them to go to look for these things? So is it, you know, go back 10 years or is it? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure, Mr. Reiner, what the time period was, or how far back does this company go, Mr. Burt? That's I think it's everything on record. Okay, so then I'm going to say 15, just to be a middle. Generally, your, your criminal, if, you, if there's a criminal history check, it's going to have whatever is on there that hasn't been expunged. Thank you. Okay. Um, Councilor Bordelon is next, and then Bob Gardner. Uh, thank you. Yeah, no, I think it's really important that misdemeanors are on there because, as we saw, you can plead down to, so it doesn't lessen the crime. If you have a great attorney, money walks, and things can be pled down to lesser or expunged down the road if uh, you have the means and, 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 and great uh, legal uh, representation. So I think from the reports that I've seen in my own experience, everything's going to be on there. And I think at that time we present the report to the to the council or the decision makers on the um, uh, vetting the developer, and we can pick them apart. I mean, you could have things that don't pertain to 
I'm not saying I'm for drinking and driving, but I'm saying like, what if this person had a past at one point with alcohol use and he had a few DWIs? Is that gonna preclude him from 20 years ago of being a great developer? We have to look at the stuff that pertains. Bribery is definitely something. Um, you know, money embezzlement is definitely something, um, certain felonies. So I just really think that taking the report, and I don't think we really have to pick it apart now. I think every report is gonna present itself in its own unique situation. When you look at it and pick it apart, it will then present here we are, and the red flags will be there at the time for the council um, uh, to review. Um, but I think what we were moving towards was at least having something to look at this time. And we didn't have that before. So um, I also think the background check should not just be criminal. I think it all should be like, how did this um, developer achieve goals in other communities? What was their partnerships like? What was their working relationships like in other communities? Meaning, if they had deadlines and goals, did they meet them? Um, a lot of the stuff is in the paper in the local areas and towns where they develop. And you'll be able to easily find this stuff with quick Google searches, uh, property that you know was planned to be completed in 10 years if it's not the developer's fault, but maybe they didn't have the funds secured properly. So I, I think it just needs to be a robust blanket invest, you know, background check, and each individual thing will be um, unique to the developer at the time. Um, and that's where I think this is kind of tough tonight. We're picking apart the uh, Pleasant Valley property, but we really haven't set our own RFP process. So I think it's kind of hard to do it in real time with this development because we really didn't do a new RFP process, which I think would be allow for a longer discussion and process to be able to put forward. But since this proper property has no developer at the time and we're trying to move forward, I think it's important that we don't move too fast in this small confined council meeting and make wrong decisions and not really kind of vet this in its entirety. So I, I, I kind of feel uncomfortable rushing through this when we don't have an RFP process in place and picking this one apart and saying we're gonna set the precedent now on this one. I, that's, I don't think that's what the community wanted. I think they wanted a full deliberation of the process. Thank you. Councilor Baumgartner? Definitely, um, I would agree. We should certainly assess the criminality of you know the specific, um, you know, instance where they ran afoul of the law. Um, certainly want to differentiate, you know, um, certain misdemeanors and, and uh, felonies in case, you know, four counts of fifth degree conspiracy, bribery, class A, mis you know, pleading down to a class A misdemeanor. You know, certainly that that's where we should not be engaging with, you know, with those types of uh, unscrupulous developers. But in terms of, you know, um, you know, someone who may have, you know, been caught smoking a joint back in the day when it was illegal, uh, certainly, and, you know, come to find out they've, uh, you know, been contributing members of society or now, you know, successful developers and want to build in our community, part of our community, um, you know, I think that shouldn't preclude them from um, bidding on a property or, or um, issue, you know, responding to an RFP. So, um, what I would recommend is just, um, you know, I, I guess, can uh, John, uh, it's not a recommendation, I'm sorry, uh, John or Paige, can you kind of speak to that, uh, that differentiation of, you know, of, of those, the very, you know, different crimes and, um, yeah. <laughs> did, did you want the chief to, or do you want Mr. Reiner to? Uh, Mr. Reiner. Mr. Reiner? Um, my forte is not the difference between types of crimes. I would actually turn probably more towards the chief on that. Um, if you are looking for, we're looking for direction on what type of process well, I, and what you want us to look into. Yeah. Um, and if that is felonies, if that's misdemeanors, doing full background checks with a specific firm, we can do internet searches and see what we can bring up with preferred developers uh, as well as you know their resume uh, those are all things that we can incorporate into the rfp process no and I, I have no doubt that the chief would be able to answer that question but you know you you are at the negotiating table engaging with developers you know i, I my question is you know if you're soliciting an rfp and and receiving asking for a response you know 
in order to properly vet these people at a bare minimum, what type of people would you want to be working with? I mean, it, it's if the, this is a person, you know, if they've engaged in bribery in the past or, um, you know, have a spotty track record and ran afoul of the law because of the work of being a developer and being a business person, obviously we wouldn't want to work with them. And so I guess I, I want to have a better understanding of what what you're comfortable with is dealing with, because I, I personally wouldn't want to be working with anyone who has a record of white collar crime, um, and who, especially, uh, giving public property in many cases at a a you know a discount, so that they they can obviously develop. Benefit to enrich themselves, and so if we were to do that, I want to ensure that the people we're dealing with are, you know, are <laughs> law-abiding citizens. I'll call you. Oh, all right. yeah, uh, I, I call think it, it, that's an easy one to get behind. Where things get a little murky sometimes is many developers have been sued by people um, for some of the developments they've done. There's often a lot of litigation. So that's where things can often get murky and things turn into uh, he said, she said, how, what court cases are still pending or not. That's where things can always get a little funny. Um, and, you know, not all developers are created equal. Some may have done things in their past life that they're not very proud of, and then they have a very successful track record afterwards. Um, I think if we looked throughout the larger uh, Connecticut, New England region, we probably find a lot of developers that maybe had made a few bad choices in their life, but then later on corrected it. So I think that's something we have to flesh out. But uh, really, at the end of the day, all of what is brought to the council is a recommendation on a developer. We're trying to just find what that baseline is of what you're looking for. Obviously, um, uh, I think there's certain things we're looking for and not. Paige, I don't know if there's anything more you wanted to add to that. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I think there's a careful balance. It's a two-way street when we're marketing our properties and we're attracting investors to our town. It's not just uh, about them being fortunate enough to come to Groton. We're fortunate enough to have them interested in bringing their resources as well. Um, Clearly, we have the right to demand whatever information, certifications we need, background checks. It's more, I think, important to have clarity as to what our expectations are, rather than who do we, who do we feel comfortable doing business with. Obviously, we would like someone with integrity and professionalism, but unfortunately, as John stated, um, many. Many developers have some blemishes. Um, they're, they're not necessarily sweet and clean, and I'm certainly not char characterizing all developers, I'm not, but uh, certainly developers that are coming into our town working on private property uh, simply come in, they get the zoning approval, building permits, off they go. We need to certainly meet a certain standard to make sure that the town is protected, and that we're dealing with a development team that we're comfortable with, but at the same time, we also have to realize we haven't been known as a business-friendly community, and we are trying to attract investors to do the right thing within our community. So I think that's why we're looking for the clarity. And if we simply want to say we need the background check and we take it from there, like that's, that's fine, but we were hoping that we could refine exactly what we're looking for, because that question is going to come up. Uh, developers have, have said, what are, you, what are you looking for? You don't trust me? You don't think I have integrity? They do take it personally. They get offended. And so it is somewhat of a dance at the two-way street as we're trying to entice the developers and build our community at the same time. Councilor Borland, you have a, about 10 seconds left if you want to follow with anything. Yes, I, I'm all for second chances, um, but I, I definitely agree we need to establish a baseline. Um, and um, it is my hope. Time's expired. Okay. I just want to make sure. I think you said borderline, but I think you meant Bob Gardner, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Excuse me. Yes. You see, called them borderline. Borderline. I'm sorry. No, it's, all right. it's okay. I'm looking at my. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, wait, I have right. five seconds. I apologize. <laughs> no. um, Mr. Burt wanted to speak, and then um, 
myself and then Councilor Franco. I just want to mention, you know, in terms of what we're doing tonight, it's solely for a draft RFP, RFP to come back to the council right. for further discussion. It's kind of a starting place. Um, we're pretty much ready to bring the, pro you know, we started the process for RFPs at the last meeting. We're ready to bring that back right away. So I imagine we'll time out together well. And as you're working on those, you could choose to finish up the one and then see if there's things from that you want to apply to the other. Um, and in terms of criminal background checks, I think there is, I've, I've been checking around a lot on how other places do it. And definitely the way to do it is at the RFP level to make it clear. Because if I think part of where people take offense is you get down to the preferred developer and then suddenly they say, you know, I want, we're going to do a criminal background check. That's definitely where they seem to take offense. But if we make it clear up in the up front in the RFP what the expectation is, I think it's not as big an issue. And if you don't get people, you can always relook at it. Okay, I'm gonna take a turn here, um, start my clock. Um, one of the things that I think is necessary to find a way to take care of is if you do a background check, but you discover later that a record has been expunged. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a criminal justice professional, but we need to do whatever check is necessary to figure out if there has been a record expunged. So whether that's something as simple as a Google search that the firm you would hire would take care of, or if it has to be something more in depth, I don't know how you go about doing that. Um, you know, is it like 50 states and you have to go through every single criminal justice system? Or, or Chief, do you, you raise your hand? Do you have an answer for if that? A, if a record's expunged, it means it never happened. It, it doesn't exist. Every record of that in the criminal justice system uh, that is in the care and custody of any official entity has to be destroyed. So it, if, if there may be news media stuff, right. but, yes. but there's not, you know, anything that would be in the possession of a government agency has to be destroyed. And so it, then, so then I, I misspoke when I used the term expunge um, because that would, as you said, disappear. So then um, we need to find, I don't know how you do that. How do you find the, the you know, old media that relates to the records that no longer exist, which is... A very real problem. Um, so whatever we have to put into place to do that is what my concern would be. And I'm not sure if that's as simple as search, you know, just running. Yeah, all web we can searches. do is an extensive search and see what we can find. But I think also part of what we'd want is maybe some sort of affidavit that they sign on on their background that you know they've revealed everything there is, and that we re you know, reserve the right to then pull out if something else shows up. That type of thing. So, so is that something, Mr. Reiner, Mr. Bronk, that what Mr. Burt was just speaking of, could that be incorporated into this item as far as the background check, a, a signature on an affidavit that they've been upfront with us and none of this stuff exists? Sure, I, I think that could handle it. Again, we're looking for what is the level of comfort from the council and what the council is looking for. So if that's something, you know, in addition to a background check looking for felonies and misdemeanors, uh, internet search and uh, a signed affidavit, that, you know, we can work with our legal team on that specific language. If the council as a whole feels comfortable with that, I, I think we've covered our bases. So I, I would feel if, if that were incorporated into it, this, this signature on an affidavit that would allow us um, the ability to void any agreement, I think that would be um, something good to include in any RFP that we were doing that would provide a safety, safety valve for the community, I, I think would be a good way to go. Okay, so I have... Um, Franco, Parker, Melendez, did I see your hand? Bordelon. Okay, so Franco, um, Councilor Franco, I'm sorry, you have the floor. Thank you. So we have learned that many states or some states don't report misdemeanors in a background check. So even if you do a background check and you could say, hey, we want to see misdemeanors, they're not going to maybe show up from many states. So that's not, there may be issues there that we're not going to find. I have, issues with possibly doing Google searches and looking into articles, because as we know, reporters don't always report everything correctly. And if you're gonna take a reporter and say that's fact, 
and then you're going to hold it against a developer on, for some reason, there's legal issues there. So I don't know if potentially doing Google searches is the right way to go to really hold something against a developer. Well, in the instance where, like, that we're all familiar with, uh, Google search did reveal the full court record, you know, so it can get some accurate information, and it just gives you a line of questions, too. It doesn't mean you're going to automatically roll it out, and obviously, anything we do, we run through the attorneys, so. So Eileen Dugan is here. Can she come up and pot potentially discuss this, then? Because I will say that working in HR, there are some serious issues about looking at people's Facebook accounts and looking at things and holding this against one of your staff members. So I'm just saying that I think that there's a lot of potential issues of pot doing Google searches, but that's me. Oh, I, I mean, I, I just agree with that in general, that there are issues. Oh, I'm sorry, did you want me to? Um, I think, and, and it's a good thing you're here, perhaps you can provide some guidance. I think we need to be very careful about um, the things we're saying this evening. Fair enough. Yep. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not directed at you, that's directed at all of us, and I think we've been kind of leaning in because of, of experience. But sure. um, just, I would caution everyone to be careful, and please right. feel free to jump in and I don't quite you understand at all what's going on here and why you're being advised to be careful from the mayor. I'm not sure what's happening here. I'm not advising the attorney to be careful. I'm advising the counselors um, that we should not be bringing in to bear anything that we have in our current circumstances and open it for discussion this evening. I don't think I've... I'm not Any saying, of us I'm not that. saying We're discussing you, Councillor Franco, an RFP. I'm just asking everyone to be mindful of the situation. And if you don't feel that that's appropriate, then speak freely. So I think on a, on a generic level, obviously there are a lot of issues to deal with. You're talking about, for example, HR issues, right, and what you've seen. And certainly I've seen those issues as well in trying to sort out what you can, what you can't use, what's been uh, approved on, you know, by, uh, by somebody signing off in the employment context on a, on a background check notice, which perhaps would be similar to what we have here. Um, I really can't say to you that this would be okay, this wouldn't be okay at the moment as I sit here, but what I can say generally is, do we have to be uh, considerate about the steps that we're taking? Yes, and I think um, Mr. Reiner said before that, you know, as we look through this, he would talk to the legal team about what we can or can't put into a disclosure. Um, and I mean, I think that's all, that's all fair. I just, I don't want to commit something, you know, that I, that I will be saying next uh, week, oh, wait a minute, perhaps that wasn't the best, best way to go. But what I can say again is, yes, there can be pitfalls and concerns, and we'll need to be careful of those as we go forward. So are you saying that Google searches, looking at articles, reading up on a developer by something and as a reporter would report, is something that could be used as accurate? I don't think that's quite what I was saying. What I, what I was saying No, I'm just asking because simply some other people here are saying we should Google search and read articles and see if they've right. done their work. And, there and that's could what I'm be. saying. I don't know if that is considered right. an actual investigative reporting that we can trust. I, I think we might be throwing around, we're talking about different different terms that may or may not apply in this context. For example, and, and I'm jumping for a moment, you know, if we're in the employment context, we might have to look at the Fair Credit Reporting Act and have certain sign-offs on that, et cetera. I can't tell you exactly what the parallel might be here. So, you know, when Mr. Reiner was talking about, oh, what is this going to look like, you know, if we're, if we're asking for uh, felonies, if we're asking for misdemeanors, if we're asking for this or that, what will they sign off on? What will they approve of? I think that might, you know, go into perhaps what it is that we can actually look at, just like it goes into what we look at when we do HR stuff. So what I would suggest that we ask our attorneys what we should be, what would be allowed and what would be comparable to possibly like HR, what's comparable in the development, development world with construction and of that nature, what is typical to use. Because I don't think any of us sitting at this table is experts in that field that can say this is what we should or should not do and then legally they could 
our town attorneys could come back and say, well, you're not allowed to do many of these things. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we have enough information to sit on this bullet point and decide at this moment. Mr. Bird? If you'll leave it up to staff, we can talk with our attorneys and bring a draft, something for the, for the council to look at. Okay, we have several counselors who wish to speak. I'm going to go to first time speakers first. So we have counselors Melendez and Obrey, and then we have counselors Parker and Bordelon for their second time. So, Councilor Melendez? Um, I prefer a process of staff um, bringing their recommendations and then we, we looking through it. Um, just a quick question to the attorney on an affidavit. Um, it doesn't seem like I if we required an affidavit to be signed saying that they have no criminal history, if something were expunged, uh, probably the, the, they, if they had a criminal um, on felony that was expunged, they could probably sign that they had no criminal past. Is that correct? Sure. So I think that's a parallel to the employment law context when you look and there, there's actually a specific law that, that states if you've had these things expunged, if these things have happened, it's appropriate for you to sign off in a certain way. I just can't say that there's necessarily this parallel with what we're talking about. So we just have to look at that. But Okay. Yes. Yeah. And and again, I I, I um, agree with the town manager. I, I I think we should just have the, what the town staff recommend. And they bring it to us, and we sort of look through it. So. Thank you, Councilor Overy. You have the floor. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, in the course of um, doing rentals, which is a whole lot more simple than that, but. I can go online and in a day have all, all the information you could possibly want on a particular person. I just have to have, they sign a form, I send it into a company, they tell me their credit, they tell me their past history, they tell me their, uh, if they have any police records, etc. the whole thing. So I would expect that that might be the easiest way to begin because that can be done at a side. It doesn't have to be something that we're putting regulations on. And I think anything past that, then we should turn to our council and say, would you review what's here or we might have had you do it and then you review it and you say, you know, I think this is, I think this is fine. I think the other thing that can be done very easily is as we've done these interviews, they've usually brought somebody in that talks about financing. Now, uh, that part of it I have not been part of, so I don't know how far they go with that, but it would be normal to have a letter saying that they are in fact bona fide and they are going to have this amount of money to work with and, you know, the, 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 you can you can do this without upsetting anybody. I'm quite sure. I'm sure it's things that they're pretty much used to when they go into a town where people don't know them. I don't think this is ours to to satisfy. I think it's um, I think our, our our manager and our council and our staff can can do the initial inquiry that needs to be done in order for our proposal to come forward. Um, if I might say, I, th I think you have to look at this the same way that I look at when I'm going to sell a house. When I'm going to sell a house, I'm going to go to that house and then I'm going to go to the town records and I'm going to be sure that the zoning is correct and I'm sure, going to make sure that if there were any permits pulled, they've, they've been signed off on. There's a, ho a whole group of things that you do with, which they're doing with the land. And that's, that's step one. And then you put out for people that might be interested in it. And when you go out, you're telling them what is appropriate in that area. And then you get your proposals. And then when you select one, you can bring it to the council and do a presentation. It doesn't have to be redone. That's what's really been happening in the process. And uh, it might be out of order to say this, but we got our fingers burnt. Now everybody's overreacting. We have a good process. If we stay with the process, maybe add a couple of things as far as a little bit more in background, we should be in a very good position because you have to think about this. When somebody comes in, 
and they're going to be putting millions of dollars into a project. The people that are sitting there with them saying that, yeah, we're going to finance it, and we're his attorney, and et cetera, that's a lot of money. Your time is up. Pardon me? Your time is up. I had so much more to teach you. <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we are listening. Um, okay. Councillor Parker for your second time. Okay. Um, I can agree with bringing it back to our attorneys, but my question would be, um, could you check with the other municipalities about the, how they do their background check on the RFPs, and maybe that gives our attorneys some ideas? Maybe we can go from there so that you guys discuss it amongst yourselves and then maybe go from that point. And two, um, just a, I don't know, but I'm going to ask you anyways. If the developer has been sued, um, I know there are certain things that are they're sued for. Do you guys take that into consideration? And do you look at how many times they have been? I don't know about that part of the process, so if you can explain that a little bit more. Who do you want to answer? Mr. Burt, I think, wanted to answer your first part. Mr. Burt and then staff if they can. Thank you. Um, geez, and I just lost what was your first part. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I put out something to all the uh, first selectmen, town managers, etc. I didn't get a ton of responses, and I also, you know, did internet searches, etc. Uh, almost nobody does background checks. <laughs> now it's recommended, you know, uh, from a lot of other sources I saw in the RFP process. However, some of the respondents like, you know, we should probably start doing that. <laughs> so again, we're sort of ahead of the curve on some of it. Now, just to mention my own experience with lawsuits, there's so many lawsuits, as Mr. Reiner mentioned, that you know, can be associated with different contractors. Like I'm especially interested in myself is if you saw they did work for Waterford and there was a lot, you know, what appeared, you know, you look at the topic, what appeared to be a major lawsuit. Well, one of the things I do is, you know, talk to Waterford because they're, you know, as a reference then and see what happened there. And then you know some things to ask the developer and try to get to, the, you know, the bottom of it. But John and Paige may have something else to add. And then um, Mr. Reiner, you want it? Either one. Mr. Reiner, if you could answer Councilor Parker's other questions. Please. So, um, in regards to weighing how many times they've been sued? It, basically, but it, are there different types of lawsuits you would be looking at as you're picking a developer? Uh, is there some that are ca cause for concern, or are they just normal business practices? I, I think we'd have to look at that on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, if someone has a very one, all if, if someone sued, some of that might come up in some type of a internet search or court search, but that might not necessarily show up on a background check. Um, so I, I think it all really depends. I think that's something we'd have to look into a little bit. If somebody had a lot of pending lawsuits, we'd want to look at why, and those could be some follow-up questions. You know, again, if, I think if a developer came in and was sued in every single town that they ever did work for, you know, I'd say maybe that's a red flag and we want to, you know, look at what our other options are too. Um, uh, you know, I think it all depends. I don't know if you want to weigh in any more, page on that. Councillor Parker, what is simply, it, it does depend. I would say there's a high percentage of developers that have been involved in some lawsuit at some point in time. So if, I think it really depends on whether there's a consistent trend or is it in a normal course of business where there are lawsuits with tenants, property owners, municipalities. Okay. So do you guys check for those now? Did you, did you hear the question? Do you check now? Do you, you repeat? I'm sorry. Do you check if they have lawsuits when you're doing this process now? Is that part of the process, RFP process? Or is that after we've chosen the person to say, hey, well, it was probably after you've chosen the person. Do we look for that too? Is that a s step that you guys look at? When you're picking the person, do we look at if they had lawsuits or anything afterwards? Do we look at the business as a whole or just certain things of the business? 
are you asking historically what have we done? Yes. Yes, historically, we try to get as much information as possible. Um, we, we do look at their background. Actually, I was gonna mention earlier, if you look in your packet, there are um, attachments. Uh, we have affidavits now, non-collusion affidavits, anti-kickback affidavits, we acknowledgement. Uh, we wanna know who their offices are. We look at their references. Um, Councilor Overy talked about finances. We, we delve into that. We, we try to get as much information as we can as a part of this process and evaluating each of the proposals and their team. So it, it's always in our best interest, but at the same time, uh, I have to admit, we weren't necessarily going back and looking decades ago at each individual and exactly what happened in all scenarios, particularly if we couldn't find uh, that information easily. So, but, but to answer your question, yeah, we look for a whole picture. picture. We look for their, their experience and history because we have to believe that the way they handled things in the past has some bearing on how they're gonna deal with the town crop. Thank you. Okay, we are on to Councilor Bordelon for your second time. You have the floor. Thank you. So I think it's important to realize that we're in the position we're in. We're talking about this because this wasn't the practice or the idea that we use or the model for documentation prior to this. As a counselor and as many counselors, after it then was brought as people were for it in its entirety. When it came before the council, because of our RFP process and development process, where we're not really brought to the table at an earlier phase, only two councilors were involved in that, one assumes that all this was being done. And so when folks address you and say, well, how could you agree to this developer because they have this, this, and this, we're agreeing to something that we think the homework is being done, and this is what's presented to us. So I think the important part of this is that it's not just what we ask to put in there and what things we accept, it's the process in which if town councilors are spearheading a development in our town, we need to know what we are defending, what the background looks like, and there, there are gonna be things that one is going to accept. And it's one thing if everyone up here could say, absolutely we knew that background, and I was 100% for them. But I, I couldn't say that, and that was one of the reasons I took my name off because I assumed that the background was being done. So when looking at this, I think at this point, any starting point is better than what we've had. And I think that's, that's the momentum we should build. But once again, we're, we're talking about Pleasant Valley tonight, and, and we're trying to build our whole basis on that, and as John stated earlier, we have not finished the process. So I, do, I know someone brought up Google searching. It's not Google searching from the stance of the reporter. It's if you see something like someone reports someone got a DWI and there's a report and they're in the paper, they probably got a DWI, the reporter is going to report factual on that. Now, their opinions are another part of it. But at least the articles get you to a point to find documentation on things that may have happened. So I think what, what I feel I learned is we need a more robust process in which we're doing such. I think if it's pretty transparent at the beginning to all the developers that are moving forward that we're going to do that, and we do, that way when we pick our preferred developer, we will see the background checks in front of us, and it's a more transparent process. That's, that was the intention or thoughts I had hoped for, is that a simple background check initially would be done. That's the first phase of getting them in. Now you have your top three. The council reviews it and sees. And then at that point, we all have a stake in saying, wow, well, we don't really like this end or this end or that end. So I think the diving board should be set, let's set the bar first and let's grow from there. As, of, as we stated, we have nothing and we can have something now. And I think also we need to make sure that all the counselors are aware of what we're agreeing to when we're agreeing to a preferred developer. We need to know the facts and what we're agreeing to and that is the background and the work. And that's something that I think should happen at the beginning phases. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Zapari, I, I want to make sure I'm not missing you. Everyone else has spoken. Did you wish to chime in, sir? No, I, uh, well, I've been trying to remain silent because I, I think that the background check in, uh, in our recent uh, problem 
is not the part that destroyed it. I think that the people that lived in the area oh. really didn't uh, want to have Councillor Zaperi. Point of Councillor Zaperi. Councillor Zaperi, there's a point of order. Councillor Zaperi, excuse me, Councillor Zaperi. What is your point of order? Um, I, I ask that uh, the Councillor Zaperi not speak uh, regarding the neighbors in that area. I find it highly disrespectful, and I, I think that we're talking well, about. Councillor Councillor Bordelon, um, I, you're, excuse me, I'm going to call, I'm going to say, Councillor Zaperi, would you please refrain um, from discussing other items and stick to the item that is on the agenda, which is the RFP for Pleasant Valley School, please. Thank well, you, sir. I think we're doing the RSP. We're trying to develop ways of uh, uh, approaching the uh, of uh, future people with RSPs, and that's what the dis discussion has been all along. And I think it's gone amok. Uh, I think it's. I think we do need to do background checks. I don't think background checks are very complex. I think they can be done fairly easily. Uh, I don't think that uh, it needs a whole lot more. And to imply that that's the reason for our difficulties now is is quite quite far afield of where we are. Thank you Thank for you. letting me speak. Thank you. But I have tried to keep silent because I knew I would upset a lot of people by saying what I view as the truth. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Burt, Mr. Reiner, Mr. Bronk if you have enough from us as far as specificity. Yeah, I was going to speak to that, and I, I think, as a matter of fact, for the rest of it, we're set. Um, okay. Speaking of the selection committee, we had the draft process. We already have that as a starting draft. We'll Could bring... you just re repeat that for us, please? Okay. The, the third bullet is the uh, selection committee. Yep. We have the draft um, re reuse process where we already have just a draft committee. Yep. We'll plug that into here for now, and Excellent. we'll bring the process back to you, and whatever changes, because we're soliciting your input, your changes yep. for that, and whatever you set that committee at for the process, then that's what we'll use for Pleasant Valley. Um, and anything else you want to change at that point, but we'll bring the process to you before you make any final decisions on a okay. RFP. All right, very good. Well, thank you. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Um, at this point, I think we'll take a we'll take a five minute I, break. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Can I ask one question before they disappear? I don't think they're going to disappear, but yes, go ahead. Have we had inquiries into Pleasant Valley in the last six months? From uh, folks that did not bid on the project, you're asking? Right. I mean, it was out there, and uh, then it went away. Oh, no. I mean, it's a small town. People know that it's probably basically back on the, on, on the bidding side. Have we had anybody that's inquired about it? Yes. Okay, so Thank we're you. still okay with people wanting to come in and... Okay. So, Excuse so, me. Um, we, we need to stick with the topic at hand. Uh, Jesus, it's my last night. Just leave me alone. It's not your last night. It's my last night. It is um, 8.40. We will be back at 8.45.
there's no motion made in advance. Um, this is the referral that um, I initiated that we had quite a bit of support for. Um, and tonight we're going to talk about the potential prohibition of the consumption of cannabis on public lands. So, Mr. Bird, I'm not sure who wants to start this. If, um, if the attorney will. Sure. I'm attorney Duggan, thank you. Sure, I'm happy to start. Um, with regard to the prohibition on cannabis, this is part of the, the recent law. And I'm just going to read a portion of the law that pertains specifically to this item. And it concerns um, municipal powers. And it comes under the General Municipal Powers Act, which is 7-148. And it provides that uh, municipalities may regulate on any property owned by or under the control of the municipality any activity deemed to be deleterious to public health, including the burning of a lighted cigarette, cigar, pipe, or similar device, whether uh, containing wholly or in part tobacco or cannabis is defined in section one of this act, and the use or consumption of cannabis, including but not limited to electronic cannabis delivery systems as defined in section 19A342A, or vapor products as defined in said section containing cannabis. I'm going to stop just for the moment at that that part of it, but I think that frames um, in part your the, the discussion that the council may wish to have. Um, that's specific to adding to the public health section um, and your powers to regulate issues pertaining to public health, the inclusion of prohibiting um, smoking cannabis, and as it also says, or the use or consumption of cannabis, which I think goes beyond just smoking and can include um, other means of uh, ingesting or smoking um, cannabis products. So that's that's a start, and I think it's um, perhaps important to note as well that in other um, sections of the act, it was made clear per under state statute that um, smoking cannabis, et cetera, is prohibited uh, in municipal buildings. Um, as well as sort of says the area around, which is defined as a 25-foot area outside of the buildings. It's also prohibited in school property and on school grounds. So those are things that are already taken care of, you know, as you start to think about this and think about what else this might include. Now, when the, the statute talks about property that's um, under the control of a municipality, the statute itself doesn't specifically define what that means or what, what areas that might include, but the Office of Policy and Management has provided some guidance indicating that the bill broadens uh, this area to include property that a municipality controls but does not own. For example, for the purposes of this section, property that a municipality controls includes but is not limited to sidewalks, parks, beaches, municipal land and buildings, et cetera. Again, I think p at least part with the smoking is already covered um, in municipal uh, buildings already by the other statute. So um, I think as you kind of start to look at some of this, it's just, I think, important to know that there are some things that already are taken care of. And so it's your consideration of if you would want to ban uh, the use of these products in other areas, and also knowing that if you don't ban them, then they can be used. So, you know, it's 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 a your decision. Can and you this would have to be. I'm sorry. And this would have to be via um, via ordinance if you intended to uh, impose a violation or a penalty for it. And just as reference point two, just in checking to see if we had other ordinances related to this. There's actually an old ordinance on tobacco already re regarding vending machines, et cetera. So it's not necessarily that that this would go there, but at least there's some reference point for that as well. The last thing that I, I didn't speak about in the last part of this subsection of the statute is that um, you may actually, municipalities may actually prohibit, um, prohibit use in outdoor settings of restaurants. Um, state statutes prohibit indoor use, uh, but it can be extended to um, outdoor use uh, or the outdoor areas of restaurants per municipal legislation. Could you please clarify, um, page 85 talks about state parks and beaches. That is already in effect, correct, the prohibition? Yeah, so state parks and beaches, that's yeah, separate, state controlled, yep. Okay, very good. All right, so I'm not sure if um, 
Mr. Burt or the chief wanted to add anything or if we should just open this up and um, begin discussion. I don't have anything. All right. Do we have discussion on this item? I may just offer one other item mm -hmm. too that just came up while I was looking at things is that you know recognizing well that the town may um, uh, have an ordinance that regulates this um, if the city and Groton Long Point do not have regulations and the towns would cover it but if they do have regulations they would control their own areas and the city in fact has a specific tobacco free ordinance already Um, I just wanted to quickly ask, what is our, you know, nicotine, you know, smoking tobacco policy in Groton as it stands? So right now there's not a specific ordinance in place. There are um, employment policies that address things as well as there's a, a, a again, this is, gets a little goofy because there's a no smoking policy in the library, but that would already have been covered by state statute. Our parks and recs group um, prohibits the use of uh, smoking, uh, tobacco, et cetera, at the dog park as well as at other uh, areas where it has programs. So those are the outdoor venues that, that those cover. Okay. Um, and as you stated, the city and Groton Long Point, they would fall under their own, obviously, jurisdiction on this, so. If, the, if it's contrary to what the town legislates. So this ban would allow folks, but it would not include people who have it for medical use. This doesn't have, right, this, this doesn't address medical use, medical right. issues, et cetera. Um, uh, because they're, I mean, I know cancer patients that have had used consumptions just to be able to go to work as an alternative form and their job doesn't preclude them from having it, for example. I'm working at, you know, as, you know, when I volunteer there, uh, people have other ways that they're using. They're not smoking it, so it's not impeding anybody else, but, um, you know, it, there, there are people, so the consumption of and how that's regulated is, I mean, obviously not driving under the influence of, that's a whole other category, so making sure. So but this, so your regulation of it, if the town chose to do it, is very, it's very specific to municipal properties and um, properties, quote, controlled by the municipality. So it wouldn't get into anything employment related, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. And it wouldn't, and it wouldn't be medical, that, that's what I heard from people, were the people medically related. They would not fall under this umbrella. Right, I, I don't see, frankly, how they, how they could, I, I'm guessing that there would be even an ADA accommodation, et cetera. I have to admit, I've not gone back through and looked at the entire medical right. section, but the whole issue about you know medical um, dispensaries, et cetera, is completely so different. the way the way this is now, it would be if a person was smoking a joint on their own property, but then stepped onto the sidewalk, they could be fined. If the town chose to extend it to that point, the town doesn't have to. Right. No, I'm, I'm throwing out the thought, right. like, like it, right. what the regulation so you, would look like. Right, you'd look at things like, well, is it sidewalks, is it, is right. it beach, is it the uh, town park, well, you know, what are the other mm -hmm. things it could be. So it's, it's, there's potential, but I think you would have the ability to um, identify where it I guess my, my question for the chief would be, like, from an enforcement level, I mean, you know, how, how is that going to work if, if we did have the more intense, like, for you guys, like, running around trying to put the manpower to, you know, facilitate that, you know, Johnny walked down the street because he went to a neighborhood party smoking his joint from one house to the next, and the neighbor calls in and says he's out there smoking on the sidewalk. Now the cops are called. Like, how is this going to be enforced from, from the, ta the town side? We would enforce it the same way we enforce it. Uh, I would make it akin to motor vehicle violation. Oh, he's on mic. Could you use oh. the mic, please, sir? Thank you. Uh, we would enforce it um, similar to the way we enforce motor vehicle statutes. This this would fall under 51-164, which is a municipal ordinance. If it were to be passed, if there were a municipal ordinance covering this, our officers could write an infraction as long as the fine is between $90 and $250. So it's an infraction. And it would be handled much the same way we handle motor vehicle offenses and other similar infractions, violations are called, not, not really misdemeanors or felonies as you were talking about earlier. So we would enforce it the same way. All right. Um, and then my other question, how would this play into um, development or real estate, um, you know, dispensary places that would be 
um, legal under the umbrella, right? When it, you know, the legalization with this. That's, that's, that's right. So this is completely, completely separate. This is just about, you know, regulation of uh, the use on public properties. The other mm -hmm. part of the act and statutes deal with, you know, retailers and mm -hmm. um, you know, micro cultivators, right. et cetera, all that stuff. Right. So this is just being um, public, private. Right. Okay. I think that. Um, I mean, I think. If we're going to regulate it to that capacity, I think we should be regulating cigarette smoke first at, at the same level. I mean, that way, I think it could get really confusing for uh, police officers to walk by. What were they smoking? I, th I think police officers are trained to detect the difference. They know the difference between the two. I'm, I'm not d downplaying the fact, but I'm saying if you show up 30 minutes later and a person, you know, I mean, it would be a lot to just pull somebody in and, you know, yeah, if they don't have anything on them to say someone saw you smoking. A again, it's not—it's not an arrest; it's an infraction. Right. It's not, they're not going to be pulling anybody in. That would, you know, that wouldn't mm -hmm. be. That's not so what they would do. So this would be stronger than our smoking law in the town of Groton, correct? No, uh, I, of cigarettes. I, I think when you read the, the um, act, is actually, it references uh, smoking already. It talks about the ability of a town to um, anything, any activity deemed deleterious to the public health including the burning of a lighted cigarette, cigar, pipe, or similar device, or this. So if, if the town were to decide to um, enact an ordinance to this respect, I, you know, could certainly incorporate everything. So I guess one, one of my only examples, I look at like par four, right? The town owns that property. And people step out to have a cigarette while they're having a beer. And what if someone stepped out to have cannabis there? That would be a town property after they're golfing or golfing on the golf course or drinking or smoking cigarettes. Like right now it's allowed to smoke cigarettes. So that's the only establishment I can think of that's town owned that has like a bar atmosphere with smoking. I'm just trying to understand what that would look like for that facility. I think you can tailor the ordinance as you saw. I'm sorry. Fit. I think you can tailor the ordinance as you saw fit. But I mean, just right, right now, if, if somebody was smoking marijuana outside, it would, potentially be a problem. You know, I mean, the law would prohibit it, so. But I, what I'm I guess what I'm trying to say is that at, they're allowed to smoke cigarettes at par four. I thought there was no smoking on town property. So Your I'm just trying, is to, up, Council I'm trying to understand how the lines are being drawn. Is that considered town property was my question. You know, I, I, I say yes, it's town property. The okay. golf course is town property. Um, it's leased, I think we lease it to the building, the building, the building itself. Um, I think it's something you just, you know, you can explore as you address the, the ordinance as well. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Obrey? Um, so what we're basically talking about tonight, though, is um, discuss, discussing the potential prohibit of consumption of, of, of whatever you want to call it on public land. We're not talking about what somebody does in their home. Correct. We're just talking about what somebody does walking up and down the street and et cetera. Not really even being specific to restaurants at this point, right? No, you, you could, the, this, the statute as amended would allow the town to um, regulate the use of the products in outdoor restaurant settings. You don't have to do that. Um, it just extends it that far. Other than that, it's very specific to, you know, town-owned or controlled property. Thank you. That's all I have at this moment. Um, Councilor Franco? So I wouldn't actually consider um, the cannabis similar to cigarettes, I would consider it more closely to liquor, as it's both would, is mind-altering at some point, you know? And is there laws about drinking on town property? Is there laws about walking down the street and drinking a beer on the sidewalk? Yes. And can you elaborate? There's an open, there's an ordinance covering the open container law here in Rotten. I'm sorry, say that again? Open, open container, it is prohibit, uh, prohibited. There is an ordinance covering that. I, I don't remember the site, but I have, I am aware of it. There is an open container law here, or ordinance in the town of Groton. And is there on like public property? We can't, you know, I mean, 
on municipal property? Like you can't drink at Sutton Park, can you? There's, there's a parks policy, I think that covers. Mr. Burke, could you, you use a microphone? Sorry. I believe the parks have tailored something for that. We'd have to pull up. The, I think the parks have a policy that that prohibits it prohibits it in certain areas. I would like it to be similar to that, where you're not just everywhere able to, you know, smoke cannabis. I um, I would think par four is a, is a different situation. It's actually a leased property, and it's not really. Although it's our building asset and we're responsible for some of it, it's actually leased by somebody and they have the rights to do some things there. But um, I would just consider it like drinking and it's not something you do in public walking down a sidewalk and you don't do it. It's not permitted on municipal property and I'm pretty good with that, I think. I for example, I can tell you the answer. parking so we'll, we'll hold on for one minute because I think they're finding an answer for Councilor Franco. There's one thing with regard to drinking and the dog park that the rule is specific that there's no drinking or use of uh, use of tobacco products, etc. Okay. I'm sorry. In schools, it's already covered. You know, smoking and drinking. Did you, did um, gentlemen wish to respond or? Yes, I'm oh, certainly, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't <laughs> think of providing that for you. I apologize. That's why he's the chief. Exactly. I think it might be on already. Is it working? They usually walk around and turn them all on before the meeting starts, so you may have turned it off. <laughs> Why don't you take this one to the left? I'm going to start singing karaoke next. <laughs> um, here's what it says. Consumption of uh, and possession of open containers in public places. The possession of open containers of alcoholic and intoxicating liquors and the consumption of alcoholic liquors on public streets, sidewalks, alleys, boulevards, parking lots, and other places in the town constitutes an immediate danger. Uh, and it prohibits, as defined under Connecticut General Statute 30-1, subsection 3, uh, possession of a container which is open and contains alcoholic liquor in the town is prohibited on public streets, sidewalks, alleys, boulevards, parking lots, and other places, except at such times as such places may specifically be exempted temporarily from the provision here and from, hereof uh, from time to time by the town council or its authorized agent. Goes on to, to say more, but um, there's also a. Uh, can you hear me? Is that? I can't tell. I don't. It's, it's, <laughs> <switch back. laughs> the lights on, but it's not happening. Um, there is a uh, parks and rec policy. The consumption of alcohol is permitted in town parks, but is prohibited on playing fields and athletic facilities. Um, and then the sale of alcohol. See, they go on to say the town manager for special events can waive the rule, that type of thing, but. Councilor Franco, you have time remaining if you wanted to continue. Thank you. I would um, sort of like to consider it like liquor, maybe a hybrid between liquor and smoking, but I will say I went to New York just a couple of weeks ago, and I was walking through the streets of Manhattan, and you could smell cannabis everywhere because they have no regulation whatsoever. And it is very out in the open, and they actually have delivery trucks that are delivering it all around town, big neon signs all over the trucks, and it's very popular in Manhattan right now. Just just in sort of preparing for this and looking back, I mean, the, the Department of Public Health has a whole set of um, programs and materials with regard to tobacco-free open facilities. Um, I think they've actually, there's something on their website now which relates to, to cannabis as well. You know, and, and I, I think the there might be a distinction with drinking in that uh, drinking in the immediate might not impact necessarily the people around you, but like what you're saying, the, the smell, et cetera, can be um, not so great for others, I'm sure, right. in park. And, and so, when you have a family with families, yeah. When you have children around, it's right. not always pleasant, I don't think. And, um, 
I would I think I probably would like it to be similar to a hybrid between the smoking and alcohol considerations and I would probably be um, in favor of banning them from public property and it also states here on page 74 that at the bottom it says through regulation municipalities may set up fines for violations by individuals regarding outdoor consumption of cannabis of up to fifty dollars so I guess that would be the infraction right that, that would be the limit that we could put into an ordinance yep right so our max is fifty dollar infraction um, but I would not want to, I don't know if I'd like to overstep and maybe deal with bars and restaurants yet. I'm not sure. Okay, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna take my turn right now. Um, I'm looking at this as a, a public health issue for the general public. Um, what individuals choose to do in the privacy of their home is one thing, but when you're out in public um, and you are consuming something that is detrimental to the people in your surrounding area who are potentially making a choice not to consume that same product, um, you're infringing on their rights. And I don't think you have a right to do that. Um, so I would be in favor of, um, for the purpose of this section, property that a municipality controls includes but not limited to sidewalks, parks, beaches, municipal land and buildings, um, to include smoking or vaping, tobacco or cannabis. Um, I also um, am not interested at this point in going to the outdoor areas of restaurants or anything like that. I think it's more important to move um, in an expeditious manner to get the public consumption taken care of right away um, to protect you know, the people in our community who choose not to ingest the substance and who may be um, inadvertently exposed to it just by being out in public on property that the town owns. And um, we are here representing the entire town, not just a certain segment of the town. So I would ask that we um, look to ensure that we are protecting all members of our society and including our children that I don't necessarily want to see um, my students or your little brothers and sisters exposed to it. Um, when someone else is walking down the street. So I would encourage the council to move forward with an ordinance um, banning the consumption um, on property that the municipality um, controls as stated on page 74. Thank you. Councillor Baumgartner. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Baumgartner. Uh, yes. Um, well, I certainly understand um, many remarks made tonight about um, protecting public health. Uh, I cannot in good conscience support uh, additional regulations considering uh, that our state just legalized uh, the consumption and sale of marijuana. Um, this was a policy, in my opinion, that should have happened years ago. Um, it has disproportionately uh, impacted uh, minorities, the enforcement of, um, uh, uh, of prohibition uh, for uh, decades. Uh, and as a result, um, we have criminalized um, way too many members of our society. Uh, and unfortunately, um, you know, many members of our society were incarcerated as a result of uh, the war on drugs. And it's my hope uh, that as a municipality, we can now take our own steps uh, to rectify some of those ills. Uh, the reality is, um, each and every one of us know people, young people, older people, um, that consume marijuana. And we have to face the reality that uh, now that it is legal, um, as long as folks who do consume it are respectful of other people, uh, not consuming it in someone else's face, um, you know, that we, uh, that those, uh, that we trust the individual to comply with existing state laws uh, and, and, um, and certainly not run afoul of them. So I, I don't support additional uh, regulation. I would note if we were a municipality over 50,000 people and we were to enact um, a regulation such as banning consumption on public spaces, we'd actually be required to designate a location or locations within town where consumption of marijuana would be legal. Uh, the reality is there are many people in our community who live in apartments, who live in condominiums, who live in multifamily homes, 
uh, that it may not be appropriate to consume marijuana within their home. And literally the only way to do so is by being outside. So uh, in, in that respect, you know, why should someone who is leaving their home, who going onto a sidewalk very quietly, um, you know, pay a fine simply because a police officer is driving by and saw that individual smoking weed. That, it, to my eye, that's just not right, and we need to move forward. Um, additionally, I, it, it was my understanding that we would also tonight be discussing whether or not we would explore in, um, a 3% tax on the sale of marijuana. Obviously, we cannot do that if the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, has, has took a stance that they're going to ban um, uh, the sale or cultivation in our community for, uh, on a or moratorium. Uh, um, I understand that's uh, in an interim moratorium and they're going to explore additional regulations down the road, but uh, can you kind of speak to that? Well, again, I think they are two different things. So one is an issue of, you know, use and consumption on public property. The other is the issue as to whether or not, you know, the, the, the town will set up rules or zoning rules to allow for uh, micro cultivators and retailers to be in town. And my understanding of that portion of the act is that if that happens, we don't have a choice with regard to the 3%. It's, we have to impose it and it has to be collected. The things that I, in thinking about it, and, and I'm not sure how much of a burden that will be to the town, which doesn't already perhaps have a system set up like, you know, uh, other, private companies do in terms of, okay, we got the cash register, we got this, we know what's going on with this is tacking on with the, um, you know, with the 3% or, or the methods to collect it and the methods to have to interface with um, the state DRS, et cetera. Perhaps we have that through the um, golf course, up, but I'm just not, just not certain. So it would be one thing to consider as well, but that's specific to the, you know, the other part of the act. And if those, if a micro, cult, micro cultivator and or retailer were allowed, then we would have to, you know, apply the tax. Um, just a point of clarification, is there an existing state law that protects us and would make this law redundant or this potential ordinance redundant? No, so there are two, the, the, the state laws talk about the indoor, um, the, the inside municipal properties and buildings and school properties and on, then they uh, extend it a little bit to the area, you know, around this 24 foot or 25 foot radius, but um, for purposes of the outdoor regulation, this would, this would need to be used. Councilor Melendez, you have the floor. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, I 100% I um, uh, am, am in support of regulating this um, in terms of uh, smoking, but is there any way to draw a sort of <coughs> distinction between smoking and eating? Um, as, as I don't think consuming um, cannabis that way sort of has an effect on everybody else is there a way to draw that distinction sure you, you, you can draw that distinction distinction because in the statute it talks about smoking or um consumption so you can make that distinction in the ordinance if you so chose yeah so i mean if we're talking about um regulating you know anything that produces a secondhand smoke um i i, I i'm all for it i think we should definitely make exceptions for for edibles or whatever else that doesn't really um, affect people um, outside of you, so thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any first time speakers before we go to sec Councilor Parker? Just I want to make sure that what we're discussing tonight is we're talking about banning it for municipality and municipal buildings outside that inside. Correct. Um, the inside is governed already. The inside is governed already. So we're looking at banning the smoking or vaping of marijuana, um, cannabis, marijuana, um, outside, for instance, Groton Senior Center. We don't want it outside on the property because it could affect everybody else. I can agree with that, and I agree with Council Melendez about the consumption because it's not affecting the person if they're doing that. Um, I do agree with having just the municipal buildings and properties because it could affect someone. And I know a few people who are allergic to it, so it could have an adverse reaction if they're smoking it right near a person in a municipal building public space. 
So that's my concern for that. Um, I just want to make sure we're only talking about municipal buildings and property at this time. Thank you. Just, yeah, and, and just for clarification on that, you know, it says properties owned or c but controlled by, which again then relates to beaches, parks, sidewalks, etc. It doesn't have to pertain to all those, but it can. Do I still have time? Yeah, you do. Okay. So. The sidewalk, so if somebody, like Council Baumgartner said, somebody goes outside on their, to the edge of the property, by the sidewalk, will they get in trouble? I guess, I guess it's... It's like, <laughs> it, so somebody's going to ask it, I'm just going to throw All it right. out there. I guess the defining, the, 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 the answer would be, are they on property governed by that ordinance? Are they on the sidewalk or are they not? You know, we're kind of splitting hairs there, but to, to the point, if, you know, if there's an individual down there smoking it and intentionally blowing it in someone's face, there isn't yes. an ordinance, you really can't do anything about it. Okay. If they're doing it intentionally and there is an ordinance, you, you probably could. Okay. Which covers the streets as well. Street, yeah, the streets as well. It's not specifically stated in the OPM guidance, but it's I can't imagine that it's not the streets as well. You have it. You have over a minute left. Okay. Sir. Unless we exclude the streets and the sidewalks, can that be done? So if someone literally, if they have to walk outside their home, they have young kids, they can't smoke it within their home. Uh, and we're only talking about recreational use, though, correct? Not the medical marijuana, because. Right. So if someone goes outside their home, steps on to the town property because some of the properties do you go out your home and you're stepping onto the town but they can't smoke it in the home that's where it's going to be catching hairs yeah I mean, you, you can the, the council can choose to construct this ordinance at, as it sees fit it doesn't have to it, what i'm describing to you is trying to share with you the broadest scope this is a, this is what you could do it's not what you have to do you know and you could parse certainly some of that out whether it's you know ing uh, conge ingestion or you know saying okay it's not going to be the sidewalks but it's really it's really yours to make you just have the boundaries that I'm describing okay. thank you okay um, Councilor Overy um, going back to what the first page said here is you know the town council will be discussing the potential prohibitation of the consumption of cannabis on public land i don't think that there's any problem with that at all i think that's exactly what we should be saying and i would hope that that may be what we come back with i had a question on it says requiring them upon petition of 10% of the voters to hold a local referendum on whether to allow recreation sale of marijuana or whether to allow certain types of cannabis businesses within the municipalities. Are we talking to that tonight as well? No, I'm going to let uh, Mr. Birder, the attorney. Sure, I mean, yes, we're, okay. that, that's separate, dealing with the retail sale and cultivation. I'm sorry. I'm that's okay. That, that's separate. That's a separate part of the act, dealing with the retail sale or cultivation. This so is just be, about. That'll be another step that we go forward to. That, that certainly you can, you can discuss. Isn't right. that planning and zoning handling that? Oh, sorry, yes, planning and zoning right now. Okay. okay. Oh, yes. Well, I, for one, have no problem with this. I, if somebody wants to smoke it in their home, that's fine. If they're going to go to a friend's house and they're going to do it, they're inside, that's fine. Uh, but past that, I don't think we need to uh, allow it at all. You know it's going to happen, but we should not be encouraging it by saying, oh, sure, go any place you want and enjoy it. At, it to me, that's just uh, just not the way to go. This is a good town. We want to keep it as a good town, and I think we have to be conservative in how we we approach it. Um, my next door neighbor in Florida, every night he goes out and on the deck and has some and it, it drifts over and I finally said to him, will you buy some good stuff? That stuff stinks. <laughs> <laughs> that's his prerogative, you know, that's his prerogative and I don't have a problem with that at all. 
so you could be drinking a bottle of wine. So, but uh, to be out and doing it, no. I just want to say that that's not anything that I'm in favor of. So I hope others can look at it the same way. And, and I also would say it might be a good idea as we go on with this, maybe after the planning and zoning that they will make some recommendations that wouldn't be needed, but if they don't, it might be good to have a public hearing on it. Thank you. Okay, we're going back to um, second time speakers, unless Councillors of Perry wanted to speak. Okay, so we've got um, Bordelon, Franca, and then I'll speak again. Councillor Bordelon, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Um, I just want to say I agree with Councillor Melendez, like, you know, an edible or consumable um, is no different than, you know, I mean, I, I don't think, I think smoking, though, cannabis or cigarettes, I really think the ban should also include nicotine to make sure that no one's smoking outside of public uh, town property as well. Because if we say that marijuana is insulting, um, the smell as well. I, I thought, you know, cigarette smoke is, is uh, people are allergic to that as well. And I think if we're going to take that to that level, I think all of our property, because consumable, if I drink a beer here, it's not going to affect you. Um, if I eat something here, it's not going to affect you. But if I smoke a cigarette, marijuana, or whatever I smoke right here, it's going to affect everybody that's around me. So anything that's you know seeping into someone else's lungs is you know a form of a contaminant, and so I think if we do this, is there a way to make sure we include nicotine in that? Um, because I think uh, the vape crisis that's going on right now um, is everywhere, and people are blowing it, and some people think that vaping is better than cigarette smoke, so they think that they can vape close to you because you know it's not the same, it doesn't smell, but not everybody wants to inhale vape vapors from from manufacturers I don't know where they got them from and where the chemical was made so I would like to see if we're going to ban it at all on town property for smoking it should be smoking as a whole because it's insulting in all forms no matter if it's marijuana nicotine whatever you got in that pipe I, I, a lot of people don't want to smell it um, so that that would be my recommendation um, I think stepping outside the senior center to have a cigarette or stepping outside of the town hall to have a cigarette you should have to leave the property to do such now you're gonna be on the sidewalk I, I don't know my next question is, what about town-owned own property, like um, subsidized housing and things like that, like senior housing? Where do we, in our town, because I can't think of the city side, I have to think of the town side, any, any properties there that would fall under this jurisdiction? Well, we don't. There, that's independent of the town, the uh, senior residence properties. So I don't, I don't think it'd be affected unless they have a public road or public sidewalks there. Right. We can look at it, but I don't right. think it'd be. So I guess the question is, like, the sidewalks there are considered public. I, I mean, I, I can see not wanting, you know, wanting to, I hate going into Stop and Shop, and out front they drink coffee and smoke cigarettes right at the front, and I have to walk through the puff of cl the cloud, you know. Once again, we're not going to regulate that, but I think, yeah, I think smoking of any, and it's not targeted just cannabis, it's smoking any nicotine of anything in anything where people have to be exposed to it in great length on public property. And I just want to be clear, because some people keep saying whatever they do in their house, this ordinance would still allow people to smoke their cannabis on their front lawn if they want. Right. So as much as we try to avoid it, I mean, there are, I, I have a friend recently that says the guy comes out every day, smokes in his hot tub, and the hot tub's right up on the property line, kind of like what you were dealing with. So you can steer, your kids are still going to be driving their bikes by, and someone could be laying on their front lawn smoking a cigar of cannabis. I mean, so the exposure will be there, uh, and it will be allowed to be, if my, if my understanding correctly. I'm sorry, I apologize. If it's on your front lawn on your property, you're, this, this would not. Correct. Correct. Okay. I can support um, banning it in public spaces, but I would like to add nicotine in there as well, making sure all public buildings, you have to leave the property. Okay, um, Councillor Franco for your second time. I would be open to a public hearing and find out what our community thinks. And also, um, I don't think we should, probably edibles would be something that we shouldn't be policing because I'm going to check everybody's brownies, their gummies. I mean, I think it gets a little too much there. I think the, um, as I heard earlier, there's legal consumption of and sale of cannabis, and it's become legal now, but 
there were there's regulations when liquor is legal now. I mean, there's regulations on these things to for the greater good of our community, I think, and the safety of our community. And um, there was something that did pop into my attention that um, we may want to also review the BY, BYOB ordinance that we have so that there will not be after hours businesses that might be like staying open all night long till 5 a.m. serving cannabis. And um, they may have to be the same kind of things as um, with our BYOB because it's not regulated like with liquor in some establishments. We might want to add it into the BYOB ordinance. Um, and so let me ask the chief. Like, this is your specialty, the laws and everything. So can you tell me, is it harder to, like, like when we're first instituting a rule or a regulation or a policy, is it easier to start off hard and then maybe ease back later? Or is it, should we start off soft and then add on regulations later? Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I, it's working now or not? Yes. I think as a general rule, I mean, it's easier to get it's easier to back off on something than to increase onto something, right? If you say this is the standard now and you try to tighten it up later, it's harder to do that as opposed to, you know, making it more prohibitive now and loosening it up as you go along. This is all new territory, right? I mean, this is not something that we've explored before. Um, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm highly confident our officers aren't going to be patrolling the streets, looking to jump out on people that are smoking a marijuana cigarette. I think that if there is a, a conflict that arises because someone's on public property and they are smoking it and a parent calls and says, hey, listen, I, I got my kids here. I really don't want them exposed to this. I, I, th I think as a public policy uh, uh, matter, the, the town council should seriously consider that. If there's areas of the town that you want people to occupy, you know, I don't want my kids exposed to that. I'm, I'm sure other parents don't, and I don't know that it's necessarily a law enforcement issue. It's a public policy issue. What, 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 what kind of community do you want to live in? And that's not saying people can't smoke it. It's legal, as, as pointed out. They can smoke it in plenty of places. Uh, but I think that you want to go with your lowest common denominator. If the people want it, they don't want to be exposed to it, I think that ought to be a consideration, too. And I, I think maybe one of those, you mentioned having a, uh, a, a, a town meeting or town hearing on this or... Uh, I would certainly be interested in hearing what gas has to say about it. They're certainly one of the more vocal advocates in this community when it comes to substance abuse and how it affects our children. That's something that I would advocate that you'd, you'd listen to hard as well. It's uh, uh, such a such a group of advocates that, that, that put a lot of time and, and thought and, and research into this. Thank you. Um, I think there's lots to consider, but um, would there be a possibility for us to have a public hearing maybe in a matter of weeks on this notice? This isn't regulated by state statute that we have to have one, so I mean, we're having a um, public hearing. Yeah, it'd be similar to what we do is what we're planning with Riverview, yes. So can I make a motion to have a public hearing on um, The potential prohibition of the consumption of cannabis on public lands. Say it one more time, please. I'd like to make a motion public hearing. for a public hearing related, related to the discussion of the potential prohibition of the can consumption of cannabis on public lands. It's basically the last sentence of the... Okay, I'm going to read it back to you, okay? So give me one second. So the motion by Franco is to um, schedule a public hearing related to the potential prohibition of the consumption of cannabis on public lands. Yes, I know. Shall I set the date or will they set the date? Well, um, we do, how did we do this last time? I think we set the date afterwards when we looked at everything to see where everything was, right? Yeah, you want to allow enough time to get the word out there. The hard part is you're running into 
you know, holidays and turnover. Right. Does it, so we have a, if you we would have like, a, it's your motion. So if you want to add a date, go ahead and add a date. So it's, it's still like your thing that no one seconded yet. So if you want to pick a date, add a date to it. I think that's the second Tuesday of the month is the 9th. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. I'll set it for November 9th. Now, if you're going to record, oh, sorry. So, no, go ahead. I was going to mention, like last time, the reason we did the river review tonight was so we'd have enough time to put it in the paper. Yeah. If you don't approve this to the second, and then you want it the ninth, it's going to be tight to get word out there right. really well. And I, I might also suggest that the way that that was worded on the referral was was fairly broad, but it also includes the term consumption, right. which I think respectfully wasn't where you were going with that as I understood it, that it was more about the, the smoking or the use of e-products that contain cannabis. I, I don't know how specific you want to be and I just don't know if what you say for a public hearing might be misleading to people or might g cause people to be perhaps more uncertain or more, more upset with what it is and, and you know even to say, I, and I understand why it's written that way, public lands. I, did, Oh, yeah, municipal property. I, you might you might want to phrase it a different way to be sure that everybody understands really what the input that you're looking for. Did you wish to rephrase, Council Franco? Oh, no. Let me make sure too that the, the town attorney is available on the ninth. So, so just to start with, do you want to change it from consumption to smoking or vaping? Sure. Uh, point of point of clarification. So then, is it just, I just want to ask, and I'm not criticizing saying it has to be, is it smoking or vaping of any products or just, this is, we're talking here, I'm, this I'm, I'm asking. This is Councillor Franco's I'm asking. motion. I'm just talking about cannabis right now because I think if we do anything else, we should do that in a separate motion mm -hmm. and deal with one topic at a time, I think. And if that wants to be brought up in the future, I think we could deal with that as well. Okay, so then I'm going to read you what I have, and then um, you can choose whether you want to adapt it to um, what the attorney has recommended. So I have written down um, to recommend a public hearing related to the potential prohibition of the smoking and vaping of cannabis on public lands. Did you want to change anything about the public lands aspect or leave it as stands? I want to just sort of leave it because... Okay, so does it's not it just municipal, it is the sidewalks and the road, you know, it's things of that nature that I have heard some people saying they don't want to see it on the sidewalks, so I want to leave it as public lands. All right, so I'll perhaps, read it one more time and then... Excuse me? Sorry, perhaps public municipal lands? Say because again? It's public municipal lands, it, it, just so it's distinguished from... We're not talking about any state properties, which would also be public properties. So I'll read it one more time, Councilor Franco. To recommend a public hearing related to the potential prohibition of the smoking and vaping of cannabis on public municipal lands. Yes. Is that, okay, so that's a motion by Franco to have a public hearing as per what I just read. I will second that. Um, And what were you saying about November 9th? Oh, oh, that's fine. Double. November 9th mm -hmm. date would be fine. Well, we I think or, Mr. Uh, Burt said he has to check to make sure we can get the notices done. Do we have enough time if, it, if it's not approved to the second? To go, yeah. If you're ready and set to go for the Wednesday, because we're not having a meeting on Tuesday, we're having it on Wednesday night. So if we approve it Wednesday night, you'll be good to run it. I mean, yeah. I'm That's gonna, what I, I probably better check on that with the paper just to make sure okay. what, what their deadlines are. I don't okay. usually uh, I don't do the postings myself. All right. So then there's a motion on the floor to set a public hearing. Is this discussion related to the public hearing? Yes. Councilor Bob well, Gardner. It's it's a uh, no. I'd like to make a motion. Um, well, we have one motion on the floor. So I'm not sure what are you trying to amend? Yes. Because this isn't this isn't budget, so Yes. All right, go ahead. Yes, I'd like to amend the motion to include tobacco smoking on municipally owned property. Okay, hold on. Okay, so then it would read, um, public hearing related to the potential prohibition of the smoking or vaping of cannabis and tobacco products on public municipal lands. 
include, yes, including, no, I, I'd like to amend the motion to include tobacco smoking. That's what you said. I think that's maybe I didn't read it correctly because I screwed up before. Um, I'll read it. I, I'm trying to amend which, what um, was moved and tell me if this is what you're trying to say. No, I'm exclusively so. tobacco smoking. Not cannabis. Not cannabis. So you're stripping out. Can, but that's so. So if I'm that's recalling correctly, um, that is. I believe it's out of order because it, it is negating what the item on the floor is. I'm getting a nod from our parliamentarian. <laughs> well, I'm just thinking out loud, thinking, checking my head. I, I think that negates, and that is not what the item on the floor is, so it would be ruled out of order because it doesn't pertain to 2021-704. 2021-704 is about canvas. Right, I, I'm just looking at it really simply and just saying it's a completely different motion. Does Madam Mayor, may, may I speak to that? So the can Cannabis Municipal Authority, which is the agenda item, is the, and correct me if I'm wrong, was granted by the state legislature. That is what we are. We are the cannabis, we're dealing with the Cannabis Municipal Authority this evening. And so the laws governing including tobacco smoking was included in the legal the legal uh, the public act 21-1 so it is germane because it, it says existing law allows municipal and municipalities to regulate activities deemed harmful harmful to public health including tobacco smoking on municipally owned property the bill broadens this to include property that municipal, the municipality controls but does not own. And then it goes on to say, for, uh, but not limited to, including but not limited to sidewalks, right. parks, beaches, municipal land and buildings. So. May I, may I ask, I apologize, Andre, may I ask just, are you saying, I think the question was, is your motion solely that the public hearing will be on, I'm just generalizing here, banning tobacco on public grounds, or are you saying, oh no, I'm just amending to ban cannabis and tobacco. No, I'm making an amended motion to ban tobacco smoking on municipal property. In which addition, is granted through the municipal. The, the but the, in addition to. Yes. In addition to. Okay, I think the confusion in, in, no, was no, no, not in addition no. to. Not in addition to. No, not in addition to. You're saying to forget the cannabis. cannabis. Yes and only insert tobacco, which I'm saying is out of order because it doesn't pertain to 2021-704, which is the item on the floor. I, it's just hard to see how you can, I, again, I'm, I'm talking just generally and practically to say um, y your motion, it seems like just a separate motion because your motion is, is um, Mayor was saying, just negates entirely uh, the motion. Dilatory, that's Rachel. the word I wanted. Dilatory motion. I've got to find it. So we're, my, my, my point is we're deciding to single out cannabis smoking when the municipal, the, the, the discussion item includes tobacco smoking. So we are choosing to ignore tobacco smoking by virtue of the motion that Councilor Franco put on the floor. So I'm looking at Robert's rules. Um, Section 39, dilatory and improper motions. A dilatory motion, a motion is dilatory if it seeks to obstruct or thwart the will of the assembly as clearly indicated by the existing parliamentary situation. Um, improper motion, I'm trying to find the exact passage here. But it, it does negate, we, we had to use this before actually. Um, it, it takes away what the original motion was. And I keep going back to it. The, what we're debating is 2021-704. What you are going for is something totally unrelated to the matter at hand. Therefore, it would be ruled out of order because it wasn't pertaining to this particular item. If you were taking Councillor Franco's motion, which included cannabis, which is the topic of this item, and added to it tobacco, that would be acceptable because this is pertinent to 2021-704. If you're trying to remove the gist of the item that is on our agenda, that's not an appropriate motion. So I would rule you out of order. And I think I think the attorney is in agreement. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm being honest with you. I'm not looking at Robert's rules right. again. I'm just trying to think it through practically. Right. And so this, it appears that 
because of what you're you're seeking to amend and completely remove yes you know what was there and then add something completely different I think it, and this is where I was going before where she's going to say that if if you are amending the motion to say oh I also wanted to include you know prohibiting um, tobacco I, I, I could that I could follow as well um, I'm glad you're here because I'm ruling the motion out of order, so thank you. Um, if you'd like to amend, we can entertain an amendment, but just striking that completely is out of order on this particular item. I'd like to put a motion on the floor, amendment. And that would be? I'd like to just add tobacco um, and vape product like as a whole. I think from a regulatory standpoint, Hold, I please, hold, please. Mm -hmm. I got to write because I'm going to forget otherwise. So you want to include... So vaping in general, anything, any so, type of thing that is affecting everybody else's health, well-being so, at a, a public building. So to recommend a public hearing related to the potential prohibition of the smoking or vaping of cannabis or tobacco mm -hmm. on public and public municipal lands. Correct. Be yes, um, because so, I think it's. So, is there a second? Second. Hold, please. Include tobacco. Okay, I'm going to read it one more time to be sure I'm clear. So the the amendment by Bordelance, seconded by Bumgardner, is to recommend a public hearing related to the potential prohibition of the smoking or vaping of cannabis or tobacco on public municipal lands. Is that correct, Councillor Bordelon? That's correct. Okay. Um, and there's a second by Baumgartner. Yes. You may speak actually, to your amendment. Actually, I, I think it should be vaping in general because some people don't, there's some vape products that don't have nicotine in it. Councillor Bordelon, I just read it to you. And I apologize, and okay. I, ask, I, and I apologize, be, be, give me a minute. I just thought when you reread it back, it sunk, and I sometimes retain a little bit of different speed. I also think it's vaping of any products should be on there because right now there's a huge problem in our school systems with vaping and it's not necessarily nicotine in the, in the vape products. So are you withdrawing your amendment? I, all I want to add is any vaping products. That's all. May I just, just Yes, add, please. I so I, I think with that, where you're going, it, it has to be within the statute, you know, for us to, to cover it. And so perhaps the... the um, the amendment can read as the statute reads. Sure. And I'm just saying this generally to regulate on any property owned or under control of the municipality any activity deemed to be deleterious to public health, including the lighting, excuse me, including the burning of a lighted cigarette, cigar, pipe, or similar device, whether containing wholly in part tobacco, cannabis, as defined in the, this other portion of the act. Uh, including electronic cannabis yes. delivery systems as defined in this section or vapor products as defined in another section containing cannabis. Um, th that's, that's clear to me that those are covered. I just don't want, I, I don't want you to necessarily suggest that there's something else out there that maybe we can't actually regulate. I, I think, th I think so, Councilor Bordelon, um, she, Councilor, the attorney is suggesting I language agree with that her. is yeah. appropriate. Are you yeah, comfortable I, I agree with, that. with that? Absolutely. So would you withdraw your motion? Yes, that's fine. And would you withdraw your second? Yes. Okay. And so would you please state if that's what you would like to have as your amendment? I would like to state as written as the attorney stated on the with record. Simply, I'm just going to X out from here consumption of cannabis. Cannabis, correct. Because again, I think folks said that that's not what we're correct. Would, but would you you're interested. would you please, for the record, so that our person doing transcription can find that easily, um, give where that because I'm not seeing that exact verbiage in the packet here. Right. It, uh, correct. It's on, I, and I'm be happy to send it to to, to Miss Hilton. Yeah. I'll yes. send it. It's uh, for reference. It's. Um, Subsection 16 of Section 8 of Section, I think, H of 71148. Anyway, it's on page. It's, it's, no, it's, in, it's important for the record, guys. Yeah, it's page 132 <laughs> of the Public Act. 132 of the public, of the act. public act, and I will forward that to um, to John. Okay. Yeah, but okay, we need so to know it now. That that is moved by Bordelon. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Bordelon, seconded by Bumgarner, and what, what has been moved and seconded is what Attorney Duggan read from the Connecticut General Statutes, correct? 
Correct. the section that was read into the record tonight, which will be forwarded in writing to the manager Correct. to be um, incorporated into our minutes. Right. So we usually, can you repeat it again? Sure. Because we usually have it yep. in writing to be able to vote on it. Um, so it's a public hearing on regulating on any property owned or under the control of the town, um, the burning of a lighted cigarette, cigar, pipe, or similar device, whether containing wholly in part tobacco or cannabis, um, including but not limited to electronic uh, cannabis delivery systems or vapor products um, as otherwise defined in the act. It looks very similar to what's on page 74 under section 84, effective October 1st, 2021, but a lot more detailed what you read. Existing law in place through September 30th. Correct. You were looking at the OPM guide? Yes. Yes. It's just the, the actual verbiage on that. So that was page 74 of our packet. Uh, where it says section 84 effective October 1st, 2021. There's kind of a brief summary of what it, the, the attorney was reading to us in the language from, um, is that OPM or OLR? OLR. Okay, so that's what's on the floor. That's Madam the Mayor, amendment. May I just speak to the motion, the, the amendment? Yes. I just wanted to say that I think when you're regulating this, if you're just driving by and not spelling it, someone vaping and smoking in public area, you can get a ton of calls of people saying, oh, it looks like someone's smoking. You can't tell that the vape devices all look very similar. And I think if we're finding cannabis to be insulting, cigarette smoke is just as dangerous to the lungs secondhand, as we've learned. And I think if we're gonna ban that, we should treat them equally and they should be banned from the same areas um, and regulated in that fashion. Thank you. Councilor Franco. So I think if we're going to do tobacco, I think we should um, do that as a separate item and on a different day. I don't, and let me ask you, if we put these two together in a public um, hearing, will they have to go together on whether they're banned or not? So if the public comes out and says, I want to ban cannabis here and we take that when we come back can we split them apart again yeah I don't I, I think the purpose of the public hearing is simply for you to gain information to help you make a decision and could you do you have to follow exactly what's provided there no so can you separate those out if you so chose later sure and you'll have official public hearings for when you actually have an ordinance. Right. right. So I would just like to ask my fellow counselors to please vote the amendment down. And if we want to take up tobacco on public lands, that we should do that as a separate item and they should be voted on separately. And that's my opinion. And um, I'm sure people in our community would may think the same way. Maybe they don't. Um, but in a sense, I can also hear that people will be saying there's a lot of overreach on some of this. So I would just like to um, break them apart and take them separately. Thank you. I'm going to speak as well. Um, Hold on, Councilor Franco, but I totally agree with you. Um, I, I think that inserting tobacco in this muddies the water. And I think right now it is imperative that this town take care of protecting our people by moving to ban the public consumption, vaping, smoking of cannabis on municipally owned public lands. If you want to take up tobacco later, that's great, that's fine. Trust me, I do not like cigarette smoke either. My husband used to smoke outside even when it was 20 degrees and snowing because I wouldn't let him smoke in the house around the kids. Um, so take it up if you want, but don't muddy the waters with this. This is important work that we get done 
and I, I will be voting against the amendment, despite the, all the work I made you do on that. Um, I will be voting against the amendment, and I think we should take it back to just hearing from the public on whether they want cannabis smoking and va vaping banned on public municipal lands. I think we need to keep it simple and not muddy the waters with this, because you're going to run into a lot of opposition that I don't think um, we need. I think our friends at GASP, um, Carolyn Wilson, would be happy to come out and speak about this. I'm sure she'll be participating in the public hearing, and I would encourage um, lots of other people to participate as well. So I, I'm opposed to the amendment and want to go back to the original motion um, regarding narrowing the focus to cannabis consumption on municipal plants, so cannabis smoking or, or vaping. Okay. Councilor Bumgarner. Well, certainly tobacco smoking is deleterious to or harmful to public health. And certainly from an environmental perspective, we want to talk about public lands. How about cigarette butts? They don't biodegrade. They last, they lay in our ground for, for years. They don't decompose. I can't tell you how many times when we've done cleanups going around on sidewalks, on you know certainly our uh, open spaces, seeing them, and you know that that certainly has an impact on on public health as well because those chemicals seep into our waterways, not and certainly you know folks are swimming or you know enjoying beautiful uh, you know beaches. And you know, in, in cigarette butts uh, washed ashore, that has an impact, especially if there's a child who is playing in the sand, decides to put one in their mouth. I mean, these are things we have to consider too. So I, I, I object to the assertion that it's only cannabis smoking that you know is harmful to, to public health. When in reality, it is a proven fact that the only thing that is prescribed by doctors to help people is marijuana. Smoking is not. Smoking cigarettes are not. Smoking tobacco are not. So I think we should treat both as such. It is allowed through, you know, um, the legislation, enabled by the, the state legislation, and not doing so what I think would be, quite frankly, very disrespectful to many people who do partake in it in our community. I would know in Stonington, they voted overwhelmingly to uh, vote down, uh, to allow cannabis establishments in their community. And I think there are far more people in Groton who would vote that way too. That's not related, but I'm just saying, I, I think there is a bit of singling out on, on cannabis uh, consumers this evening. I, I would like to stick to the topic at hand, which is cannabis. Cannabis. Cannabis, I'm getting tired and I have a headache, so forgive me. That's on the floor. We got to stick with what is on our agenda packet. We're deviating from what's on our agenda. If point, we can stick to that. Point point is taken. Um, you have time remaining, Councilor Baumgartner. I think I said enough tonight. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Bordelon. Thank you. I mean, it, it is on the packet in theory, right? It's black wrapped in here. And I think to set a precedent that we're going to go after marijuana right out of the gate and, and we realize the impact of folks dying from lung cancer from cigarette smoke and we've done nothing, nothing in the town to ever enact and allow. I find it offensive when people smoke in front of my kids. It, smoking anything, there's a form of addiction that goes with it. So to say, yes, it might not alter the mind, but there is an, a dependency on it that, that just like the other items do. Folks drink alcohol in front of children. Some people don't want folks drinking alcohol in front of kids. So I think that it's not wrong or unjust to incorporate cigarette smoke with the cannabis. I think it's a time to act now in the sense because I think it's going to be much easier to um, handle and and you know I think we should have banned smoking in front of our public buildings long ago and we have not yet so why are we delaying in doing such and we're talking about all the harmful effects of smoking any child of anyone I mean recently cigarettes moved up to age 21 for a reason it's harmful 
Cannabis can, and alcohol can't be used until 21. So kids are getting these vape cigarettes and they're leaving their households and they're out on the roads and walkways using these devices. And I think this is a chance for us to ban it and a banning smoking and lighting cannabis and nicotine. And I think they're one and the same. It doesn't mean that the final product going forward will be cannabis or nicotine alone, but I think that public discussion would allow for it to both be on the table and that we're talking about um, our public health and in areas of concern. So I do think that they're one and the same, and I think it is time to act on that. Um, and I encourage us to do so as a council. And it doesn't mean that that's the sole thing that will move forward. It's, it's open, uh, public hearing is merely discussion. Thank you. Councilor Parker, are you leaving us? <laughs> it is 9.58. Um, we are going to be at seven councilors. Okay, so we're at seven councilors at this point. Um, so we will vote on the amended motion, which is Attorney Duggan's reading, which includes um, tobacco and cannabis. I would like to uh, raise your hand if you're in favor of the amended um, public hearing motion. Baumgartner, Bordelon, Melendez, opposed? Franco, Obrey, Granitowski, Zapari. Abstentions, that's everybody, so that's seven. So that motion fails, so we are back to the main motion on the floor. Uh, so we will vote on the, sorry, the hearing. Um, all those in favor of the original motion to set the public hearing, please raise your hand. Franco, Obrey, Melendez, Zapari, Granitowski, those opposed? Bumgardner, abstentions? I'll abstain. That motion passes five in favor. One opposed, one abstention. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, it is 9.59. Move fast. Um, I move to recommend to amend Section 5 of the Retirement Plan for non-union employees of the Town of Groton to conform with practice by substituting five years for ten years. Moved by Granitowski. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Seconded by Franco. This is item 2021-735. No, I'm oh, sorry. I apologize. There was, ever, um, there was a, the amended motion. There was an amended motion. All right. I withdraw my motion. Councilor Franco. Withdraw. withdraw. And we are at 10 o'clock. They have this one? I need consensus to move ahead since we are at 10 o'clock. Are we, are, is there any objection to moving ahead with the last items? Councilor Overy objects. Will we have a quorum with everyone else? One, two, three, four, we will still have a quorum. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so we will move ahead and let me find it. So it's on the front page. Motion to authorize the manager to incorporate. Is that the one? Yes. Okay, this is the first, I'm, I'm seeing this um, tonight. So, um, motion, this is item for Ms. Hilton, 2021-735 retirement updates. Motion to authorize the town manager to incorporate language into the retirement plan for non-union employees to clarify the eligibility for a deferred pension benefit for employees who separate with five or more years of service and reach age 65, as otherwise indicated in section four of the retirement plan. I so move. Second. Moved by Granitowski, seconded by Franco and Zapari. Um, sure, I, think, uh, I can comment briefly on this, Please. and this actually relates to the, the second item as well. There was some confusion in the retirement plans about um, vesting and eligibility. The non-union retirement plan referenced at one point a 10-year vesting period, and another point indicated a five-year vesting period. So in order to ensure that there was not confusion going forward and that our actuaries were um, handling it in the manner in which the town had been handling it, 
we're uh, clarifying that yes, individuals who are vested after five years will be able to collect a pension at age 65 um, or later. And we asked that Hooker and Holcomb review that. They reviewed that and determined that the change just because they weren't in sync with what the town's practice was would result in a change to the um, a, a, actually the, the annual contribution to the retirement fund of $1,300. Um, and it seemed appropriate to take care of at this point in time. And if I may, um, if I'm not out of order, I can explain the other one as well because it's similar in nature to this. Okay, I'd prefer if we just get this sure. one out of the way and then go to the next one. Yep. So um, we're on 2021-735, which is the front half of the page. We're containing our remarks to that item at this point. Councilor Borderline, did you have a remark on 2021-735? Yeah, I, again, I just want to state for the record, like getting handouts the day of that are amended are just really hard when I put in two days work prior to the meeting and the last week to review. Um, I also, you know, first seeing this, um, you know, I, I think it's important that we act in good faith and that we're, yeah. we're giving ourselves time to review stuff. So this is really tough as, you know, like we can't, we're handed this and sure. to really read it through at 10 o'clock, I feel like that's kind of not good policy and politics to be rushing through tonight on something that I didn't do my research or contact somebody on. You know, I do my due diligence as an elected official. And so I, I think that this is something that I think should be not discussed tonight so that we have time to send our comments if we chose or whatever that may be. For, so. for, for reference on that, what we had um, determined in the process of going back and forth last week was that the narrative didn't change and the point didn't change and the cost didn't change. What changed was saying, oh, this is what we actually really should do to change to, to fix the problem. So the actual issue has not changed um, at all since it was provided to folks with their packet last week. Um, what has changed is saying, oh, this is a way to fix the problem. It's not um, modifying this section in a particular manner. It's saying, oops, you know what, we really need to look at this in this manner and, and get the language correct. So it's, it's actually respectfully not a, not a change to, um, to what was in the packet. Yeah, so in a nutshell, we are reducing the vesting period uh, from 10 to 5 years. Actually, for the non-union, it's not actually changing it. It's that the, the non-union provisions indicated in one point, oh, there was, you had to have 10 years in X, but in another point, it actually already stated vesting was five years. Vesting was always five years, but now it's just clarifying that, yes, people who are vested at five years do get a pension, and they have gotten pensions in the past. Um, so. It's, it's a correction or clarification um, more than anything else for the non-union. It's not actually a change in the vesting. And is there a reason, a reason we're doing this now? Um, we, we've actually come up with it um, on a few different occasions with, with folks and analyzing things, and it's cropped up again recently in looking at an employee who um, had fewer than 10 years of service, a non-union employee, but actually met the vesting requirements and, in fact, we went back then and said, oh, yes, this is how we've analyzed all this. We actually had analyzed it more uh, carefully back in 2018 as well, and we're handling it as a policy matter and understood that by virtue of the language that was there that already said five years vesting, we were handling it in that manner. Um, so right now it's, it's, it's just, it was clarifying with the actuaries to be sure that they were viewing it the same way and costing it out in the correct manner. And, and the non-union people have been hired under the premise of the five years, so it's also, we want to make sure we don't run into any issues and any legal issues later. So, so, the, so this is a, rec a recommendation on the part of the actuary? Um, I, 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 I I think it's done, I would say, in conjunction with the actuary to say, hey, this is what we've been doing. We have a five-year vesting policy, but look over here. Over here it says 10 years uh, and, and uh, 65, I think, to be able to be eligible for a pension, but that didn't make sense with a vesting period that was shorter than that and with the town's practice 
of actually providing the pensions under those circumstances. So, um, you know, just as in, in terms of going through varieties of things, so this is uh, appropriate to get this just clarified so that there's no confusion going forward that yes, people who are, have five years and it says in the contract and the plan already are vested, that yes, this is how we will calculate their retirement. And but only for non-union. Correct. So each yes. So each um, each uh, other uh, plan has its own vesting provision, and in fact, um, all others except the non-union police, which we'll talk about, and the and the union police, which we won't talk about. Everybody else has five-year vesting period, and it's actually said in here it is five years. So that's not the change. The clarification is saying, yes, we all recognize actuaries included and, and cost this out correctly. We have this provision over here that says there's a five-year vesting. And yes, the town, in fact, has been providing pensions to people who have five years but not 10 years of vesting. And by that, I mean it's a deferred retirement benefit. So if you have five years um, here with the town, you'd still have to reach age 65 before you're able to collect. And is what is uh, Director Landry's position on this? Has she vetted this as well? Yes. Yeah. Fully in favor. It needs to be corrected. What we none of us want is someone to get to the retirement age and they've been promised something and now it's forgotten what's happened over the years. So this is really imperative to be fixed. Thank you, John. And just you, just for clarification, this when I'm looking at this, this matches what's on page um, 86 of our packet in the bold type. This looks like it's pulled straight from there, the motion. The current motion, the yeah. The current to, motion yeah. is matching what I'm seeing on page 86. That was in our packet and the okay. face type with the red, right. red ink there. Um, Councilor right, Zapari. I, I have my hand up. Yes, Councilor Zapari, go ahead, sir. You have the floor. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to know if uh, when a person terminates their employment, uh, for, for the people in this particular category, what are these non-union police? This is um, non-union police. terminate their employment before the vested period, are they paid out the amount of money that's been put aside for them for their uh, retirement up to that point? Well, they, they get their contributions Plus back. Interest, right? Uh, plus interest if they're invested. They get their contributions back. So whatever they... They don't get the tax contribution? Correct, they do not. And remember, this is not a defined contribution plan. It's a defined benefit plan. So that would be sort of an odd calculation anyway. But they get... they Because they're not vested, they just get their contributions back. Well, my feeling is that a person works for an employer, and part of the, the compensation for that is one, contributions to a retirement plan, and two, the pay that they get in their paycheck. And so when they leave, they should get, I, I'm in favor of this motion, by the way, but I think that when they leave, they have a right to what has been uh, put aside for them, because that was part of the compensation package that they had when they started. In any case, uh, I think that reducing the vesting period means that a person who has to move from this job to another, for whatever reason, still needs to provide for his or her retirement. And if we throw away five years of their productivity toward a retirement fund, uh, I think it's not fair to them. So I, I, I think we should approve this uh, motion. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. When it's my um, turn. Councilor um, Franco and Obrey. So what you're basically saying is after five years, you're 100% vested. So correct me if I'm wrong, but after like one year, you're not at 10% and at... Correct, no, if, if you've only been here for one year, you'll get back your contributions. And nothing from the nothing town. Nothing else. And if you've been here, no, and again, the non-union retirement plan already had a non a five-year vesting period in it. So that means you're vested in terms of you would be, you could either take your contributions back with interest if you left it, say, six years, or you mm -hmm. could say, I'm gonna leave what I put in there. And that means that at age 65, for example, I will be eligible to collect an actual pension. 
All right, so let me just clarify what, what's going on here because I'm a little confused. So you, the employee contributes into their retirement. Correct. And at just say four years, they leave. They get everything that they put in Correct. and the town put nothing in. Correct. Right, because again, this is a defined benefit plan, not a defined contribution plan where the town's putting in, you know, a similar it's not amount. Like a 401 type it's like thing. a 401. So the town is not ever putting in anything. Is that the what you're town saying? is the town has to make a contribution to the pension plan to cover things, and so in general, and so here, what it's saying is to, to make this square, and so we don't have any issue from the actuary's perspective and from our perspective going forward. This again is with non-union, non-police. Um, we're going to clarify, even though it says already you get five years, if you keep your money there, you'll get a pension. Um, we're going to clarify that provision and explain basically, and this is what you get, you know, to clarify, okay, this connects to this other provision of the contract. The actuary um, determined that the cost of that, the cost of this correction or clarification was a $1,300 contribution, which means annually gets added on. It's included then in the town's um, contribution each year. So towards its pension obligation. You would have to change the vesting period, um, which you'd have to cost out if you wanted to do it otherwise, to shorten it from five yeah, years. Yeah, you and people are hired under this understanding. Five years. It is five years now. All right, so at five years, you're 100% vested is what Correct. you're saying. Yep. And then you get the town contribution. No, what you're what you're 100% invested exactly. in, what you're 100% invested in is your contributions plus interest. Plus interest. Whatever whatever has, you know, gathered on that money. Um, so you can have you have the two options. You could either say say you're there 6 years so you're after the 5 year vesting period. You could take your contributions plus interest or you could elect a deferred retirement to say, I'm not gonna take any money right now, I'm gonna let it sit there until I meet the proper age requirement, at which point then I'll be able to collect, you know, an annual, a monthly pension from the town. All right, and, you're, and this is basically just administration that we're changing the wording to match the actual correct to, pra to, to match the practice in the language, the existing language about vesting. So it's just an administration correction. Right. Right. Thank you. <sighs> Councilor Ober. I was just wondering, we don't have very many people that are non-union, do we? Oh, uh, we do have number. a fair number of people who are who are non-union. In fact. Um, we have more non-union people than actually most municipalities, uh, as opposed to union folks. That are non-union. That are non-union, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Councilor Zaperi, I see your hand, and I'm not sure if that's left over from last time. Yes, it's left over. Okay, thank, thank you. you. All right, so then um, we will vote on 2021-735. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any, aye. Op any opposed? Any abstentions? So moved unanimously with seven counselors. Um, again, I need to ask, because it is after 10 o'clock, um, is there a consensus to move on to 2021-738? Yes. I see no objection. Um, I don't know who's. Councilor Melendez, could you read this one, do you think? Yes. Thank you. It's um, on your paper in front of you on the back side. I make a motion to amend Section 10 of the Retirement Plan for Non-Union Officers of the Town of Groton to reduce vesting from 10 years to 5 years and to authorize the town manager to incorporate language into the Retirement Plan for Non-Union Officers to clarify the eligibility for a deferred pension benefit for employees who separate within five or more years of service. So moved. Second. Moved by Melendez and seconded by Franco. So uh, this one is somewhat similar, but here the police non-union retirement agreement provides for a 10-year vesting period currently. Uh, with the exception of um, the union police, everybody else's vesting period is five years. Um, and in, in looking at this and considering it, looked at the fact that it, we may want to try to attract you know, folks from the outside to take these non-union police positions, whether it be chief, deputy, or captain going forward, and the attractiveness of decreasing the vesting period um, is important. I think it goes to actually what um, 
uh, Councillor was saying earlier about, uh, Zapiri, excuse me, was saying earlier about this type of, of thing. And the second half of that motion is the same as the part that was just in the um, plan, uh, the proposal for the non-union, non-police folks, where it says we will reduce the vesting period to five years and then clarify as well and make the language match up to be clear that yes, people with five years are entitled to um, a deferred retirement benefit. So this would put sort of the, the language concept on the same um, stand as the non-union folks. So it would make the non-union the same as the non-union police in terms of vesting and pension eligibility. And I apologize, in going through this, again, we had um, the actuaries cost this out, um, and their estimate for this change would be um, a $2,200 change to the actuarial, the determined contribution for each year. I apologize, family members. Okay. I'm not seeing any discussion, so we'll vote on 2021-738. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? So moved unanimously with seven members. Um, this is now 2021-739, pension claim by former employee, and this is a potential executive session. Um, Mr. Berta, we're moving ahead with this. Okay, yes. the council is willing to move ahead with this at this point? Yes. Yes, okay, very good. So the motion in the packet says, um, I move that the town council committee of the whole along with the town manager, John Burt, and the town attorney, Eileen Duggan, go into executive session pursuant to Connecticut general statutes 1206B for discussion of a pending claim and or litigation related to a former employee's pension benefit. Was the chief Fasar supposed to be included in this? No. No. Okay. I so move. Second. Second. Moved by Grant Otoski, seconded by Baumgartner. All those in favor of going into executive session, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, so we are in executive session, and, and there, it is 1019. And there will be a motion after we come out. There so will be a motion. So the video, so Sean and Link should remain in the building. <laughs> okay, did, uh, Mr. Greeley, did you hear that? Yes. <laughs>
open at 1040. Um, and we are still on 2021-739. And I move, um, as for the town attorney, that the town council committee of the whole, upon review of the cost and benefits associated with the proposed settlement of the former town employees' extra contractual claims regarding the calculation of pension benefits as set forth in executive session, accept the proposed settlement. I so move. Second. Second. By Granatowski, seconded by, I heard Baumgartner first. Mm -mm. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? So moved unanimously with seven counselors. And that brings us to um, the end of new business. Uh, we have item six, other business. Just yes. one thing. Councilor Bordelon? Yep. Um, I just wanted to thank John for the email regarding the library. And I just wanted to see if there's any more updates on that um, because, you know, your report that you had sent out, a couple people had contacted me. And when I went down there, there were books move and things leaking, and the tiles were brown and dry, along with the mold on the doorway coming outside of the building. And, and that stuff has been there for quite some time. So I'm, I, I know in your email you stated there's not enough staff to kind of maintain that, and it takes some accountability internally. But if we could try to at least once every three months have someone just walk through and check, but it was concerned, so I'm just curious as to what's going on, and um, because I am concerned about the health and well-being of staff and children going into that library in those conditions. Yeah, the uh, and I did give a full update on it yesterday. I, I appreciate you, you know, taking yeah, my uh, my it concern. Was a, cracked, a cracked condenser or condenser pipe on a on an AC unit that leaked. And they just had to, they just left it open for a little bit to make sure they caught the, that they fixed the leak. Um, by the door, it was hit, it, it just a little bit of mildew. Um, the, it's the in and out weather, just getting the wallpaper wet and then underneath uh, created some mildew. They do go through it quite, I mean, Greg, uh, I sent out Greg's procedures, they go through quite often, but no one's better placed than the people in the department to catch little things. Um, we, uh, but, yeah, and we do take care of everything. I mean, they do a fantastic job, so I don't want to characterize like they don't. Public Works is the best. They don't have a lot of staffing there. No, and once again, my bringing this to you initially and then you following up with the email wasn't criticizing. I mean, we're elected to take on concerns of the community, and when people say the roof is leaking as a town councilor, you have to ask the question. So it's not the roof, and in fact, it's the no. AC unit. Right. And all the tiles will be replaced. And any damage, what about to the rug and the walls that it's cool, water's coming down? Yeah, we, we'll trust public works to do that, yeah. Great. Councillor Franco. I just wanted to notate that next Tuesday is election day in Groton for all yeah. of us local politicians. And our next council will be on Wednesday for everybody watching. That's great that we moved it this time. And town manager Bird just stole my last sentence, so Sorry. almost that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> And that schedule is set every every um, every fall. We set the schedule for the next year. <laughs> uh, uh, Councilor Baumgartner. Yes, yeah, so, um, I'm sorry, Madam Mayor. You said that we scheduled something at the last. I, I missed what you said. Yeah. We the schedule is set every um, at the end of every year for the following year. So that November third date was set the prior last year. So okay. we'll be doing that again. I can't remember which day it is. Usually towards the end of the Probably year. Ninth. Ninth, probably yeah. I um, and then I was going to follow up on that. Um, all the polling locations are the same, um, but um, when when uh, is this technically under new business? Are we under new business now? Mm -hmm. We are on other business. Other business. Um, yeah, just uh, I think it would be good to have a conversation about um, with if it, now that um, the state legislature they'll be voting on new. Uh, congressional uh, state legislative districts about um, voting districts and I wasn't sure when that conversation would take place because I know they're wrapping up that process and if that would be something the presumably the next council would deal with or is that something that is outside of the purview of our council I mean voting districts yeah and redistricting basically the RTM districts 
because uh, we can't uh, establish them until the state legislature is done with their work. Yeah. Yeah, and then it's governed. Well, the, the, the districts don't change the number of people who yeah, I'm not familiar are with the process. Myself. Yeah. Is it, which is tied to the census? Um, because it is based on number of voters, correct? Yeah. So I'm not sure if that's one that we can look at at any time and redistrict or if it's tied to a certain um, specific time period when it is reevaluated, kind of like the, the general assemblies do. And they're, they're tied to the state legislative districts. I yeah, that's what, I, yeah. that's what I meant. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we're, mm -hmm. Councilor Obrey is leaving mm -hmm. us at, um, what time is it? And then, and then lastly, um, also about um, now with the local municipal election of, you know, being on uh, next Tuesday, if we can discuss moving we've the polling location. I know, we've got a quorum, but um, we have both. Some of the polling locations back to their original locations or new schools are going to be yeah, built. Quorum six. Councilor zapari has gone as well? All right, so we can't we can't vote on anything or we've lost quorum, but um, you can just wrap up if you want and then we yeah, can do it. If, if we can discuss the, um, the potentially moving voting locations back to where they used to be. For example, um, the, there was a voting location. There was a voting location located at um, Westside Middle School. Then it was moved to Zabirsky House. And I hear from so many residents saying it should be moved back to the elementary school, more centrally located in that district. And then with SB Butler coming up, potentially coming offline, well, definitely not being utilized as a school, exploring whether you know it's appropriate to utilize color as a new voting location and so on and so forth. So just wanted to put so that. So that should the, be next council should yeah. be yeah. working on that. Don't forget right about now. Mary we, Morrison. We lost the yeah. quorum, so um, I, I don't even know if we do a motion to adjourn, but I will move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of adjournment? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? No, I don't know. We're doing it anyhow. Because I know if I don't, you know what's going to happen. Someone will say something. 1049 adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Be well. Keep wearing your masks. Be safe, guys.